Hello everybody, James here and my next guest, uh, just hold on a minute because I want to make this a one-on-one -on -one match with not The Undertaker <laughs> but the former referee, the former general manager and the former manager of stars past and present, it is Teddy Long, holla holla. Hey, holla holla back at you player. Oh, come on, I just when I said holla holla then I was like man I must be coming out like even more white. <laughs> no, that sounded that sounded good, play. I think you got it. How you keeping anyway, man? Hey, man, I'm uh, doing okay, man. Uh, God is good. He's blessed me, and uh, still uh, getting around, moving around. Uh, I have this deal with WWE where I go back, you know, whenever they call me to come and do something. And uh, other than that, I'm out doing a lot of comic cons. I do a lot of indie shows and stuff, so I'm staying pretty busy and. Uh, just enjoying the rest of my life, man, because I, I had a great run. And uh, I'll be honest with you, man, I don't want no full time no more. You know, the travel and stuff, you know, I've done enough of that. I did that for over 20 some years. So to be at home every night in my own bed and stuff, man, it's it's outstanding. So uh, I'm I'm just I'm just blessed. Do you know, when you say the traveling and, you know, you'll have been, we were talking off air, you know, you've been to England so many times, you've been all over the world in your capacity as all the things I mentioned beforehand. When did you get to a point where you were, where your body was getting just tired of the travel? Uh, well, I think around, yeah, let's see, I went in the Hall of Fame 2017, maybe 20. 13 or something like that, man. I was just burnt out, man. I traveling and uh, I got so burnt out to man. I started back to drinking again and I hadn't drank in uh, over 10 years, you know? So it's just the stress got me. I started back to drinking and I think I ended up putting on a little weight because I never, I never forget. I was sitting I was somewhere and Vince walked by me and he looks at me and he says, oh, you put on a little weight there, you know, but he was letting me know, you know what I mean? So, and but uh, like I said, I think it was around that time I just got stressed. And so my wife was having problems, too. She got ill. You know, she was sick and she ended up passing. So I had to go home to really, you know, see about my wife. And so once I did that and got home and got myself straight, got that weight back off and got back in the gym like I'm supposed to be and start taking care of myself. So I feel absolutely great, man. And uh, I'm just just happy to be alive. Yeah, my uh, uh It'd be my condolences. I mean, that must have been a terrible thing, of course. Uh, well, me and her were we we were married thirty some years, and um, uh, you know, and just she was, you know, she's diabetic and she had some other problems, and so she just got real ill and just wasn't able. You know what I mean? I, you know, when it's your time, it's your time. So I'd look at it like that. God, you know, was ready for her. So, uh, and her birthday was yesterday, August the nineteenth. So. Uh, as soon as I get home, I'm gonna go and uh, visit the graveside and celebrate her birthday. Yeah, happily is it happy heavenly birthday? I think the, the yes, phrase, no? yes. Uh, just going on what you said beforehand, you were saying uh, with the WWE, uh, basically, you know, when they need you, they call you, and so legends contract and all that kind of thing. So I mean, it's almost yeah. like a, is it WWE's version of a pension plan for their their favored performers? Well, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just glad they've done it. I think I was supposed to had had this earlier, but thanks to our good friend, John Laurinaitis, uh, we can talk about him. He's one of the worst people on this planet. And uh, he kept me, held me back a whole lot, even with my money and stuff. You know what I mean? He thought I didn't know that, but I did. But in this business, sometimes you can't talk and say what you know because you you can get yourself fired. So I put up with a lot of stuff from him, and uh, but that's okay. You know, I, I I still made it. God bless me to continue to make it. So uh, other than that, you know, that was just about it. Well, uh, I think a couple of people have asked about Johnny Ace, uh, and I will bring that yeah. up at a later date. But you know what? Let's take it back to the beginning of wrestling. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry to say that we're not going to have time to talk about, you know, the DJing and the James Brown stories and everything like that, because I really love music <laughs> stories well. as well. But we, we got so <laughs> many questions, and as I said, we've got six, seven pages worth of them in, so we'll get to as many okay. as we can. And we're going to go straight into Mid-Atlantic NWA. And uh, Mr. Chimera uh, says, I remember Teddy retrieving ring gear from Crockett Promotions in the 80s. Did he expect to ever get as far as he did, or did you just need the job? Uh wasn't no job. When I was taking those uh, jackets from the ring, I didn't get a dime. They weren't paying me anything. Here's how that started. Uh, I used to go down to the WTBS, the studios in Atlanta, Georgia, when they were taping Georgia Championship Wrestling. 
Well, they taped, taped that on Saturday mornings, and me and my son would always go down to watch the wrestling. Okay, so I ended up going down one Saturday morning, and I run into Abdullah the Butcher. And Abdullah the Butcher had just come to town, and he needed somebody to show him around, you know, because you know, he didn't know, you know how to get. He wanted to go to a lot of bars and clubs. He, he liked, you know, partying. And so I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So me and Abdullah met. So I started showing Abdullah around. So on Saturday mornings, he would come and get me and I would go down to the TV station with him. So when I got down there, by me being with Abdullah, I could get in the back. Back in the day, they were real strict about that. You know, k really meant something. So while I was back in the back hanging around, you know, I could, you know, feel people, you know, looking at me. And so I'm like, well, I need to make myself busy. So this was all on my own thinking. I started, uh, I'd, I'd find garbage cans that I could imp. Uh, they had a, a cafeteria down in the basement of the TV station. So I would go down to that cafeteria every morning. And when Dusty, God rest his soul, and Jim, J.J. Dillon, Jim Crockett, all of them had the production meetings, I would go down and get them food out of the cafeteria. And so I'd bring it back, you know, to the production room, all this, you know, just doing something so I could be busy. Then I started going to the ring, getting the guys jackets and coats, you know, when they take off their gear. And they kind of liked me for that because a lot of guys would leave their gear sometime and some of the fans would get it and they never would get their gear back. So for me to bring their gear and protect and take care of their gear for them, they kind of liked me for doing that. So I started doing all that. And after I kept hanging around, then there was a job come open and uh, they needed somebody to put up the ring, take the ring down. And the promoter, which is alive today, uh, Louise Manning, I speak to her every once in a while. She gave me <clears throat> that job, putting up the ring, taking the ring down. So I got that job. And one night I went to Cobb, C Cobb Civic Center in Marietta, Georgia. And that's where I that started refereeing. And the way that happened is... The ref, I put the ring up and about seven o'clock, there was no referee. So Louise come to me and she says, Teddy Long, you're going to have to referee tonight. I said, Louise, I don't know anything about referee. And she says, Teddy, don't worry. The guys will talk to you. They'll, they'll help you. So the first match I had was with Ron Bass and uh, Black Bart. <laughs> and it was a Texas death match. And they were bleeding all over the place, brother. And they scared me so bad till I jumped out of the ring and I left them. Well, when I jump out of the ring and leave him, the, I could hear the ring announcer, Charlie McGowan, God rest his soul. He kept saying, get back in the ring, get back in the ring. But I'm scared to death, you know, because they're bleeding all over the place. I think, you know, this is real. So uh, finally, I end up getting back in the ring. So I finished working the mat, but I kept thinking in the back of my head, I know I'm done. I'm fired because I done screwed this up. Cause they, those guys were cussing me, man. They were really hot. And the way that I got rescued from that is that by the time at the end of the mat, Charlie, <clears throat> excuse me, Charlie McGowan rang the bell and he rang the bell too quick and he screwed the finish up. <laughs> well, they got so mad at Charlie till they forgot about me. And that's that's how I started refereeing. When you uh, were in the back, just like busying yourself, who was the first person you remember just looking at you and just went, who is that guy? Uh, well, mostly everybody. I think <laughs> Orn was Orn was kind of looking at me. Uh, I think Buzz saw you. He was back there then. He was, you know, kind of eyeing me out. You know, basically it was kind of all the top guys, or the player, all the horsemen. You know, back then that they had that going. So, you know, everybody was everybody was had their eyes on me. Who was the first guy? Oh, they didn't know. I'm sorry. You know, what I'm saying because they didn't know. And like I said, back then, K they K Fave they they enforced that. So, you know, they like, who's this guy? He ain't got no business back here, you know? <laughs> who was the first guy who sort of like wrapped their arm around you and sort of became a bit of a friend to you in uh, in the back? Well, I probably uh, Road Warrior Hawk. Uh, me and him became real good friends. And um, he was one that kind of took me on his wing. Uh, Harley Race was another guy that came to me and helped me out a lot. Terry Funk uh, was a good guy to help me. Ricky Steamboat. Uh, helped me out a lot and basically J.J. Dillon just so many guys I had a lot of guys that you know helped me and you know tried to you know train me and learn on the way but basically back in the day you you didn't get no whole lot of help it was on the job training either you got it or you don't You're just that simple when was the first time you were allowed in the locker room uh well I was always 
you know, I didn't never have no problem going to the locker room. We was at the TV studio, uh, at the TBS studios down there. I was in the locker room all the time because when I took the gear back, I had to take the gear back to the locker room. So I never did have no problems going in the locker room. They didn't bother me about that. Like I said, once I started making myself biz and start going getting that ring gear, then they, 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 they I, I was cool. Uh, I was just thinking <laughs> of this as well. Is how long did it take for you to pick up the um, the pig Latin? You know the uh, wrestlers uh, talk in the back. Oh, uh, 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 the the uh, uh, Carney. Carney, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <absolutely. yeah. laughs> Uh, well, I used to hear it all the time, you know, and it, I never did say nothing, you know, because I was kind of amazed. I'm like, what is that? What are you saying? <laughs> and uh, after I, you know, started, you know, after I'd been around for a while, then uh, I think people like Kevin Sullivan, uh, who I really had a chance to ride with, and and, and I learned a lot from him and Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. So they kind of explained the carny to me and stuff, and so I kind of that's how you know I learned that. With uh, you being in your refereeing career, what year is this? Are we talking eighty six or around there? You become a referee. Eighty three, eighty two, eighty three. I think I started. Pardon me. Um, if you have you got like a just with the mid Atlantic, the Jim Crockett area or Georgia or wherever, um, can you give us like a top three matches that you refereed that you felt a part of? You could feel the electricity when you were there. Um, uh, well, I did the matches on TBS's TV. I was the only referee there. So I did what, man, I imagine 16 matches because they did two hours of TV there. So I had a lot of, them, you know, that I rep. I mean, basically the ones that are good, uh, uh, I worked with, uh, the horsemen a lot. I did with Tully and, uh, Arn and tags. I had, to, you know, work with them, you know, and working with those guys, you really learned back then because, you know, you got to pay attention and what you, in and, and, and what they did, you need to capitalize on that and learn because like I said, a referee's job is really important. You know, everybody in there needs to be on the same page. And if you're not on the same page, you can cause things to go wrong. <laughs> so that's basically all the top stars back in NWA back then. I had a chance to get in the ring with him, butchery. Well, uh, Ron Summers, I refereed his match before I ever started managing him. He was him and JYD, another, another great guy. God rest him. Uh, and that's where I did the the heel turn is when I did the fast count on uh, JYD, I believe it was. OK, and I stepped out of the ring then. But uh, then I they took me in. I think I was supposedly being fired for doing the fast count. And they, then they brought me back. After, no, I went to New Orleans to do uh, the in the Superdome where I turned on the Road Warriors and I fast counted them. And I had the varsity club, which was Kevin Sullivan the Steiners and they won the, the the tag team titles. And so that's when I, then I went back to TV and then that's when I did the match with JYD and run and I fast counted JYD. And that's when Jim Hurd fired me. And then I stayed gone for a couple of weeks. And then that's when I come back and I started managing. Uh, that's sort of one of the questions someone's asked further on down, but I'll ask it now is how long beforehand did you realize that that was going to be the plan? You're going to step out from refereeing into managing. Well, I didn't know the plan. Um, what happened is the way that happened is uh, Nancy uh, Benoit, you know, rest her soul too. She was Kevin Sullivan's wife at the time. And, and she was managing Butch and Run. And what they did, they had the mask on then and they were calling themselves the Ebony Express. And uh, when Kevin and Eddie Gilbert, when I started riding with them and uh, well, my career, I, I was a disc jockey on a radio station. And so once we get to ride and going down the road, we get a six pack of beer, you know, and, and start drinking or whatever. And then so I started DJing for him, turning the radio down and, you know, talking. And so they realized that I could talk, but they saw something that I didn't see. So Kevin went back and recommended that, you know, I, you know, I start managing. And so that's how the managing part started. Uh, something just going back against your referee days, who would brutalize the uh, jobbers? in the TV studio, the worst. Ronnie Garvin. <laughs> Would you boy, believe that's he, the name I was expecting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, boy. He, he, he beat those guys, boy. Ole Anderson was another one that really abused a lot of those guys. He beat them up, too. Mm. Uh, this is probably another question I'll uh, ask later on, but of, of all the enhancement talent, because you're right there, you can see who the quality uh, enhancement talent is, who your favorites, who you thought uh, really did their job the best. Oh, uh, golly, man. I can't hardly remember. There were so many guys back then that really worked. Uh, Mike Jackson was a guy that was uh, really good. And 
a lot of the guys I, I'm trying to think Randy Barber was a uh, one of them name and it was so many guys that came up but uh all those guys that did the enhancement talent were pretty good some of them were you know and they you know they come the first time then you know if you, you didn't see them no more then you knew that you know they didn't do a good job but basically all those guys that Mike Jackson brought in you know like Randy Barber uh they had a guy named Bill Tab one time. He was a police officer in Birmingham, Alabama, but he wanted to wrestle too. So he came up and he did stuff. So all of those guys that Mike Jackson had were pretty good workers because mm -hmm. Mike Jackson basically trained them. Do you remember any, <clears throat> excuse me, one time uh, enhancement who turned up thinking they were, you know, strutting in there thinking they were going to be the next big star and then someone just put them right back in their place? Uh, they, they did that to a lot of guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, I, and the kid, uh, not back just so much then. I remember they did this deal one time in in WWE. They had this guy come in, and he thought he was the big dog, brother. He strutting around. So uh, they went in and they smartened Vince up, and they told Vince about it. And so the next thing they did, they sent a body. Vince sent out and got a body bag, and they brought that body bag back. And when the guy, I forgot who that guy was working with, but when they got through with him. The one, two, three, then they sent the body bag down and they put him in the body bag and zipped him up. So Vince let him know you're done. <laughs> Someone who's watching, <laughs> please find out who that was so we know who it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we're going to go on to uh, WCW managing. Um, Ted, are you one of the favorite referees in the NWO and into the early days of the turnaround WCW? Please give us your recollections of. Ah, no, this is the heel turn. I'm sorry. So I'm actually going to move this on. So it was Road Warriors who you turned on and did the old fast mm -hmm. count against. And the next question is, I take it this is what led to you feuding with Paul Ellering. Mm-hmm. We had a match at uh, it was a pay-per-view. It was called Capital Combat. It's Washington, D.C. And after I had the match with Paul Ellering, I, and the, the thing about this, Ole Anderson was the booker at the time. And Ole, you know, he just, he he's unreal. I mean, he's a nut. Well, he's worse than Laurinaitis. But anyway, Ole and Paul, we gave us the finish for the match, and they wanted to cut my hair. Now, I, me and Paul Ellering both are bald. Okay, I got hair on the side. That's all I got. I got nothing up here. Paul Ellering got nothing. So I didn't understand what was the purpose of cutting my hair when I don't got nothing, you know. But I think it was Ole's way of just burying me because I, I got really hot about that. And I went to Jody Hamilton and Jody Hamilton, God rest his soul, he's the one that kept me from walking out. I was gonna leave that night cause I just, that wasn't right. And Jody told me, he explained to me about Ole and everything. He said, don't, you know, just don't lose your judge. Just go ahead and do what you need to do. And so I just settled down and went on out there and and, and had that match with Paul Ellering. And then I come back at the end, and uh, we had the match with the Steiners, and that's where Doom be, that won the, the WCW titles. Yeah, I was looking at that hair versus hair match. Forgive me for saying, the stakes seem quite low between you and Paul Ellering, Ellering in, in in that. But uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Neither one of us got any yeah, hair. Yeah, I know. So, that's what I was wondering. It, what, well, I didn't know then, but that's only he was bearing me. You know, he knew that later on I was going to win the titles from the Steiners, so he didn't. He probably didn't want that either. So he did that little deal to try to bury me because he knew I didn't know. Was Ole always trying to get at you like this, or was this just you just his latest target? He, yeah, well, he, Ole, I think Ole, only person, the black person that Ole really got along with, I think, was Thunderbolt Patterson. And he told me to my face, he said, the, and I'm going to say the word, he said, the only, he said, Teddy Long, he said, the only reason, he said, you want to know why me and Thunderbolt make a lot of money? He said, it's because the whites want to see me whoop up on his nigger ass and the niggers want to see him whoop up on my white ass. And that's what he said to me to my face. He's uh, just because you mentioned Capital Combat, did you get to meet RoboCop? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, what was that yeah, about? Yeah. I, I have no idea what that was about, man. That was just some kind of an attraction, I guess, that they were just adding to the show, but I have no idea what that meant. <laughs> uh, just a bit more on Paul Ellering. And I believe like your first however many matches in the business, I think I only saw about 20 that you've ever had that's been documented or found out anyway. Uh, how good was Paul at leading you through the matches? Because I think maybe your first one was a boxing match. Yeah, that was uh, Paul Ellering. I had the gloves on and uh, in at Capital Combat. Uh, Paul was good. I mean, we worked it out in the back and talked about it, and so he kept me out, you know, doing uh, when we got in the ring and uh, during the match. So he was really helpful. Uh, Paul was always a real nice guy. Mm. 
Uh, next question, Maki Zaki has sent in and asked some stories about his time as manager of the Skyscrapers, especially the legendary story when they beat up beat up on some jobber. Now, uh, I can actually offer you, we could sit and watch this match together and we could do a bit of commentary over it, or you can just talk uh, and tell me about that legendary match where Sid and Dan Spivey... Well, that was in Dallas, Fort Worth, and that was in this big horse barn arena. Well, this guy, he was another one. Well, like we were talking earlier, you know, thought he was hot stuff. So he come out and so he wasn't selling nothing. They'd punch him, hit him, and he wouldn't sell nothing. So I look up and I see Dan and Sid, they look at each other. So when I see that, I know what's going to happen now. So the next thing I look up, they got him and they just beat the shit out of him, brother. And you know what I mean? But he wasn't selling nothing, man. He just, I mean, just was being a complete idiot. So that's how all that happened. The guy didn't sell for him, so they gave him some to sell. So when they got through with him, I guarantee you, he they didn't have no nobody else. Either he left and never wrestled again, or either he learned that night not you know how to sell. With that being said, uh, did you realize that he wasn't going to be co cooperating before you went to the ring? Had he said something? No, we didn't realize that. We just knew he was kind of a little cocky, you know, and stuff. But, you know, we he, he never did say nothing backstage to, you, you know. Like I said, it was a total surprise because when he wasn't selling, that's when Dan and Sid looked at each other. They couldn't believe this guy. So, yeah, he just, just went out there. And what, what we're not been is that he's, he, he's, uh, he went in business for himself. Now, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up, Teddy, but you were such okay. a shit disturber in that match as well because at the back, you just hear, <laughs> kick his ass! <laughs> well, I knew what they were doing. Yeah, so and I knew exactly what had happened right there. He wasn't selling, so I'm madder than them. <laughs> I'm madder than Sid and Danny. You know what I mean? I'm like kick his ass, beat his. Ass. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Danny, in another interview, has said something to the effect of, um, "We gave him a bit more in the back as well." Is that true? Well, yeah, uh, that's true. Well, what happened? Tell me about the, the uh, scene in the back. Well, they just waited on to come through the curtain right there, and they just got right on his ass again, started beating the shit out of him. <laughs> Who broke it up? <laughs> or did anyone break it up? Or Didn't nobody break it up. They just, when they got, got tired of whooping him, they let him go. Mm -hmm. the, the people didn't really break up stuff back then. We didn't get in, you know, didn't nobody get in anybody's business. I'll tell you a good story. Yeah. Uh, both these guys are gone, Hawk and uh, Steve, Dr. Death Williams. I was real good friends with uh, Dr. Death. <laughs> Well, I was in St. Petersburg, Florida there, and I was refereeing their match. They was in singles, Doc against Hawk. And so I think Hawk hit Doc, and he hit him a little hard. And Doc looked at him, and Doc told him, God, fuck, you just potatoed me. So next, and then the next thing I know, Doc hits Hawk. Now they they both get mad with each other. So the next thing I know, Doc comes, he grabs me, and he puts me in the corner. And he tells me, you stay right there. Don't move. And brother, they went at it. And I'm thinking this was right in, in front of a live audience. So they went at it. And finally, when the match was over, it didn't stop there. They went in this room and they locked the door. And both of them was in there and they just beat the hell out of each other until they got tired and they come on out. <laughs> was, it, was it no score draw then? Was it a draw between them? I don't know. We don't know what happened. They was in the room. They locked the door. They yeah, wouldn't let they, nobody but in. Came, but they both came out at the same time, did they? But they both came the out. Yeah. Oh, no. They both come out. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what. There's nothing I love more than a good fight story. There'll be more hopefully coming up soon as well. Um, a couple of follow-ups on the skyscrapers. Sid and the softball obsession. Is that something that's just completely uh, over, over told? Or did he really just not turn up half the time because he wanted to play softball? Uh, no, that's true. He wanted to play softball. He was, you know, I guess he was kind of hung up on that. That was just something he wanted to do. So, uh, like I said, he put the softball sometime before, you know, before the matches. So, I, I, I couldn't tell you why. I, I don't know. How could how can the up, upper echelon, how can the higher ups have put up with that? Was it just because they saw main events? Well, well, these guys were, were you know, were, were drawing money at the time. Skyscrapers was a great tag team, man, and they were working with guys like Road Warriors and top guys, and so they were drawing money. They were they were a draw, so they needed them for that. So I don't think they really was happy with Sid when he left and had him because one time, you know, Undertaker had to step in and be Danny's uh, partner because Sid didn't show up. So they weren't too happy about that, but like I said, they, they never – I don't know what it said anything to them about it, but they weren't happy. Uh, you will probably know this answer, and I don't know the answer, is why did The Undertaker, uh, Mean Mark at the time, why did he leave WCW? 
Well, I was uh, with him when he the day that he left. Be uh, me and him both were we were in Jim Hurd's office. Jim Hurd was running the company at that time, and I was in Jim Hurd's office complaining about I was having problems with one of the guys. Okay, so Taker was in there too. So at that time, Ole was was booking. He was running the company. Well, Ole Anderson told Undertaker that he would never draw a dime, that he had red hair and he just didn't look the part or something like that. But anyway. Taker was sitting there and he talked to Jim Hurd. I was sitting there and so I guess he was asking Jim Hurd for more money or whatever. I don't know. But Ole didn't want to give Taker no money. He said, I'm just going to give you one set salary or whatever. And Taker didn't 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 want that. And so Taker left then and went to WWF. Was it just one of those things where he left that night or there was a contract to roll well, out? Or? I, 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 I think he... I don't know about the contract part or not, but I know after me and him was in Jim Hurd's office, I, after that night, I think Taker, he didn't go right away, but he did end up going to Vince. How uh, was Ollie Anderson, the uh, of all the bookers that you've worked under, we'll get to the bookers, I'm sure, at a later point, but was Ollie Anderson the one who was most interested in cutting and slashing everybody's salaries, even if they had a valid contract? No, that was Bill Watts. Oh, really? He was, he was the one who came in and did that, cut everybody's money. Now, Ole was just a guy that was just mean and evil. You know what I mean? You know, he sometimes he'd be all right. And then I think Ole did a lot of things for his own satisfaction. Mm. Uh, we will move on. We're going to move on to the Doom section now. And Jamie K. Met has asked, why didn't the tag team Doom get a longer run in WCW? Well, because certain guys there didn't like it. They they saw that they were getting over, they were hot, and they didn't like it. And I'll give you a perfect example. One night we was in St. That was the same night I was in Jim Hurd's office. Uh, we was in St. Louis, I believe it was St. Louis, and we were scheduled uh, to. We had a tag match with somebody. I can't remember who it was, but anyway, uh, Flair was working with Sting, and Sting didn't want to put Flair over. Sting refused to to drop the belt. So then I guess Flair must have got hot about that. So he went and t- to Jim Hurd and they got to get Barry Windham and him and Barry Windham, Flair wanted to put him and Barry Windham together and they wanted to be a tag and they wanted, then he wanted to work with Butch and Ron and he wanted to take our belts that night. There was no reason to do that. There was no story there. He just wanted to, to for his satisfaction. So that was the night. I think that's where I probably got my heat with him at because that was the night I walked out. I told I I told him I'm, I'm not doing it. And me and Ron both we 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 walk, we was gonna walk out. We wasn't gonna do it. Butch was the only person that was okay with it. Mm. So that's how that went down. And did you go through with it? No, we didn't go through with it. But they didn't do it. Mm. Jim heard they wouldn't do it after Ron and said we went. Ron didn't want to do it, and I didn't want to do it. So it did it didn't happen. So he but was I, the way I got it. The way I got it is. Flair was mad because Sting wouldn't give, didn't want to drop the belt to him, and so therefore he wanted to take our belts. Was Flair Booker at the time? Was it still Ole? Uh, no, I think Flair was booking then because it was Jim Hurd at the time, and I don't think Ole was going. I don't think Ole worked for Jim Hurd. No, I'm trying to think. Well, then I who, think Flair was the Booker, I believe. Who would have taught Flair out of that? Do you think? Um, uh, I don't know. Might have been Kevin. Barry Windham, a lot of guys like that, they could talk to him. We will move on. At, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dead Punk has asked, I was a big fan of Doom growing up and looking back 30 years, it still seems like an odd choice out of all the teams in WCW to drop the tag team titles to. Doom dropped them to the fabulous Freebirds. This isn't a knock on them in any way, uh, a knock on the Freebirds, but it was. It just never made any sense to me why the Freebirds and not the Horsemen or Steiner Brothers. My question is, whose idea was it to drop the belts to the Freebirds at WrestleWar 91, and who's behind the idea to split Ron Simmons and Butch Reed up as a team? Thank you in advance. Um, uh, when they dropped the titles, um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out who Flavor, I think, was doing the booking at that particular time. And, um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out who we were working with then. That's, what's that question again? Uh, why, why the fabulous free birds were chosen okay. to uh, have I the titles it. lost to? Well, I, I don't know who made that decision. That that was a bad decision. I think they was they was trying to, the Freebirds had just come in and I guess they wanted to, you know, try to get them over. And I think they had DDP uh working with them. I think he was their manager. 
And so that was, you know, by this being a fresh team, they just come in free birds, you know, and they were really hot out in the uh, world class and stuff. So I think that's how that happened. But I guess they just chose us, you know, just, you know, because we, they, they, Butch and Run were a great tag team. We had been the champions. So in order for the birds to get a little bit of a rub right there, then they need to beat somebody with some credibility. And I think that's probably why they've done that. I was say, when I, because uh, we used to get, weirdly, in this country, repeats of WCW in 1990 in the early 2000s. So I've actually seen quite a lot of doom. And I remember thinking, man, that was a tag team that didn't go long enough because they were almost like, yeah. they were almost like the new road warriors in the sense. I know Butch Reed had been in the business a long time, but yeah. they, they had that strength and intimidation that was road warrior esque. Well, they were mad at us, man. They didn't want, they didn't want Butch and Ron to have those titles. And I remember one night we was in Columbus, Georgia and, uh, they was got the uh, I think Butch had been drinking that night, and so we was working with Flair and Orn, and uh, so Butch, I mean, d- remembered what Flair had done, you know, trying to take the belts from us. So I think that's when Butch, you know, and and turned it into a little bit of a shoot. But I know he did pop Flair real, you know, real hard. He fucking punched him real hard, and then Flair tagged Orn out, and then did nobody want to come in because you know they know Butch. He's tough, and plus he had been drinking too, so. Uh, and I think Bush got in trouble that night because after we got out of the ring, I think some little kid was there and he was trying to grab a Butch or say something to him. Some Bush shoved the little kid down. And so then the police come back talking to us. So we had to, you know, kind of smooth all that over. <laughs> was uh, So Butch was definitely the enforcer then of the team. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we are, I'm going to ask. I mean, her. don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You know, Ron didn't take no stuff either now. He's tough, but. Like I said, Butch was just like I said, he had been drinking that night, so you know, it's one of them one of them things. I know, but Ron was young in the business as well. I mean, it would have been up to Butch yeah. surely to stand up to whatever. Yeah. Uh next question. Conan El Barbaro. <clears throat> Sorry for butchered your name there. Uh, regarding the classic vignette, where due to a pre match stipulation, you had to serve as Ric Flair's limo driver for the day, and then he took a different turn, uh, he being you, I'm sorry, taking Flair into the hood, where it just so happened that Soul Brother Butch and Soul Brother Ron were there with his friends and <laughs> grabbed a hold of Flair. Whose idea was it? And please share any recollections of the collaborative process and the day or day's filming. Uh, I think we did that. I think we did it in one day, one day, because we went, we did something else where I was a uh, flash chauffeur and then we did a deal where he was on the boat and all that. He had his boat and I, I had to get on the boat and do some stuff there. So the thing was right there, I think that was Kevin. Kevin was uh, kind of booking a little bit then and Flair might have had some input in it too. I, I don't know. But anyway, that that's that's how that all come about. We but we took him down to the hood and he thought we was taking him. I was driving him somewhere and then we turned on him down there and that's that's how all that happened. But then that's when they kind of started the breakup because right after that, we done that. Then I think they ended up with Butch and singles and run and singles. They both, you know, which ended up working with Flair. Speaking of which, uh, Jeff Hickman has asked your best Ron Simmons story. Uh, I guess it, the best Ron Simmons story would have to be the time that I left him in the snow. Uh, <laughs> we were, we, <laughs> We did the show in Syracuse, New York, and so we was driving back from Syracuse. Uh, well, I think in North Rochester, I believe. But anyway, we was driving back to Albany. Well, we all miss me, J- JBL, Ron, and Godfather. So we was all in the in the van. So we was drinking. Everybody's drinking beer, and so all right. So so now you know after you're drinking so many beers, you know you gotta you gotta make a piss stop. So we stopped, you know, couldn't, wasn't nowhere. To, I mean, it's just snowing out of the world. We couldn't get nowhere to go to get off to go piss. So I just pulled off on the side. So everybody jumped out. So we just stayed on the side of the van. Everybody took a piss. So I was the first one to get back in. I'm driving. So I get back in. So I'm driving the van. So I really ain't paying much attention. I'm just sitting in the front row, front seat. So I see uh, Godfather. Uh, no, I see John, JBS he get back in godfather so i ain't really paying attention i thought ron was already in the truck they close the door <laughs> i drive off so i'm driving off so jbl looks over at me john looks over and said what are you doing i said what are you talking about we're going he said fuck you just left ron i said what he said ron is not in the truck so now we can't in new york you know you got to go 10 miles to an exit before you can get off so i didn't do that i pulled over on the side and i bagged all the way back almost a mile so I could go back and get run. And as I, when I finally got back to him, I'm looking through my rear view mirror and I see him and he's standing there and he's covered in snow. I mean, his whole body, he's, 
covered in snow. And this was before he even started saying damn on TV. When I bag back up to get him and, <laughs> and they opened the door to let him in, he looks right in at me and he says, damn, Long. You know, John, and then he wasn't even saying it on TV then, but that's, <laughs> that damn came out that time. Did uh, he ever give you a receipt for that? No. He 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 cussed me quite a bit, but uh, <laughs> I think they all cussed me. JBL, they was getting on me, but other than that, man, we 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 laugh about it now. Uh, sticking with Ron, uh, Jack Curran, and also Michael King asked a very similar question: What did it mean to Teddy you when Ron Simmons beat Vader for the world title in 1992? What was his reaction in the moment when Simmons won the title? And does Teddy believe that Simmons becoming the world champion opened up the door for guys like The Rock, Booker T, and Mark Henry to become world champion as well? Well, I think so. Uh, when Ron, like I said, like you just said, when they he became the world champion, you know, that opened a lot of doors for a lot of guys. Uh, Bill Watts was the man that made that decision, you know, to put the title on Ron. And uh, I thought it was great, absolutely great, because there had never been a black, you know, world champion, you know, in WCW. The events, I think, uh, there was one with Vince. I can't remember who it was, but you, anyway, you, you can you can argue in the '60s because I think Los Angeles Territory had a couple of uh, uh, black, like maybe Bearcat Wright might be one. But anyway, please yeah, continue. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, <laughs> right. But like I said, uh, that but that that's what it was right there. I did, as far as I can remember. Uh, so uh, with Bill Watts, obviously uh, from Junkyard Dog onwards, when he was running Mid South, he always loved to have a black world champion or like top. Uh, your main eventer and then after JYD left he tried it with less success and less success uh, you know you know, with Butch Reed even though he was very good and then there was people like the Snowman and Savannah Jack and people like that uh, yeah with Bill Watts making Ron Simmons WCW's first world uh, sorry uh, first world champion who was black was it a disingenuous was it purely a business thing or did he really want to I think it was business. I think Bill uh, Watts really wanted to do that. You know what I mean? I think he wanted to make an impression on, on Ted Turner. Because the way I got the referee spot, I always heard back after I got in that spot, I heard that Ted Turner wanted that black referee on his TV. Now, that's what I was told. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got the referee. Well, I didn't get the spot like that. But once I started refereeing, that's how I kept that job and stayed in it because they said Ted Turner wanted me on, the t on his TV. Mm -hmm. Um... And other than that, like I said, with Butch, um, you know, he, I, 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 you know, Butch was the guy, you know what I mean? And like I said, with Bill Watts doing that for Ron, you know, I thought it, I thought he, he really wanted to do that. And I basically think he did it because, to make an impression on TBS. Uh, Ace. Cause I, I'll tell you another story Sorry, too. I'm thinking about that because. I remember Mr. Barnett. He was one of the promoters, Jim Barnett. And, uh, do you God do an impression of Jim Barnett, by the way, because everyone does? Oh, yeah. And he told, <laughs> and he came to me, and I never forget this, and he said to me, he said, Teddy Long, <laughs> the only reason that we put the titles on you guys is because the NAACP kept calling us wanting to know why we don't have any black champions. Now, that's what he told me, the reason why Butch and Ron got the titles. How does that make you feel? Well, I mean, back then, I didn't understand. You know, so back then, it was good. You know, I'm glad to see that we got this push and we got a good break. But now that, you know, I understand a lot more, you know, it just, they were just doing something just to do something. Like Mr. Barnett said, mm -hmm. the NAACP don't know why they ain't got no black champions. So they didn't want no problem with the NAACP, so they put the titles on us. Now, uh, before we recorded, you asked me, have we done a podcast before? And I said, no, but you may have seen me on something else. And we worked out that you'd seen me and Dutch Mantel discussing you. And uh, we, uh, Dutch was very kind and, and said that you were you know, a great interview and everything. And we also watched a video where you make Jim Cornette an honorary black Muslim after he makes you an honorary Kentucky <laughs> colonel. <laughs> where did that come from? We just made that up. Okay, like I said, back then, the writers, we weren't, there weren't no writers. Nobody wasn't writing nothing. So once he did that, and I knew, you know, with me being a heel, I you know, I knew a little bit then, and I knew that, you know, how people hated Muslims, and I know that would be heat. So for me to make a white man a Muslim, <laughs> you know, that that's kind of, that's good heat, man. So that that's how that come. I just come off the top of my head with that. Who uh, Who's the best at improvising? Oh man. <laughs> uh I guess that probably might be me. 
Really? <laughs> That's a cheating answer, man. You can't say so. Okay, apart from you, who's the best at improvising? Uh, I'd say Cornette. Mm -hmm. How many? Uh, I'd say Cornette. How many vignettes? Uh, vignettes. How many like interviews or whatever did you two end up doing back and forth over the years? Oh God, we we did a lot of them because what happened is a lot of people don't know when I had Butch, I, I had that Butch and Run. You know, they were calling me Peanut Head. Well, I told Cornette to start doing that because when I was a kid, that was my nickname, Peanut. Everybody called me Peanut. So they were trying to find something to say, you know, that would, you know, get some heat. So I told, we was around the ringside one day and we just talking. And I told Cornette, I said, well, I said, when I was a kid, you know, they used to call me Peanut. And he, that hit. He said, Peanut Head, that's it. And so that's how the Peanut Head started. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, this is probably a late question, but I'm actually going to ask it now. How well did you adjust when um, you started getting handed scripts to memorize? Oh, no problem, man. Oh, really? uh, God, it, God bless me with a great memory. That's just something I'm blessed with, man. I could, And that's one thing me and Vince liked about me, because I would go to rehearsal and I didn't have no paper. I, when I got my sheet, I already I got it in my head just like that. And when I go to rehearsal, because Vince wanted everything, you know, he he, he believed in people selling and sh and stuff being real. And for me to come out in rehearsal with no paper, then that looked that was real. You know what I mean? But I remembered all my lines, and so that's why I think I got along with Vince real well too. Because <laughs> a lot of times I would I remember my stuff without any problem. Dude, I I have to write like every single word I'm going to say down here because I've got no memory and I've got no improvisational skills whatsoever. <laughs> Even like follow up questions, I'll just I'll just jot them down really quickly so I don't uh, don't forget them. Uh, moving yeah. on with uh, during your eleven years in Crockett WCW, you suffered through many of the bookers and booking committees, and you know there were so many there. And there was Dusty Rhodes, Ollie Anderson, Ric Flair as a booker, um, Kip Fry briefly. I know he wasn't the booker, but he was the owner. There was Bill Watts. We haven't mm -hmm. really spoke about Dusty Rhodes uh, as a booker and as someone to just be around day to day. Well, Dusty was a great guy. Like I said, Dusty gave me my first job with the referee job. Dusty hired me. Uh, and so I started refereeing there and uh, Dusty, he helped me qu quite a bit. Dusty did something for me one time and I realize it now and I didn't have a clue what it was. And one time I I had went downstairs in the in the cafeteria there and I got all I got like 10 cups of this bouillon soup and i would bring it up for everybody because you know that that's how they were eating so one time i brought this soup up and i sit it down and i got ready to, i picked the tray up got ready to walk out and dusty stopped me he told me stand right over there baby stand right there wait right there tell alone so i just stood there and i'm listening to everything that's going on in this production meeting i don't know why i'm standing there i don't know what i'm listening to i have not a clue but as I stayed in the business alone, I kind of realized, oh, see, now I know why Dusty said that. Now I see why they did this. You know, it all started coming back to me. And that helped me a lot, too, with my with my uh, career, because I remember stuff that I heard. And then, it, and then it started making sense. So that's when I learned that everything you do out there needs to make sense. And I tell that to guys as of the day. But uh, that's that's kind of how Dusty was with me. And he talked to me all the time. And I remember the first time I had uh, Johnny B. Bad uh, when I started managing him, Mark Merrow. And uh, when we first talked to Dusty about that, uh, Dusty wanted to call him Tutti Fruity because he looked like Little Richard. Well, J Mark Merrow, Mark come to me. He says, Teddy, he said, they, they want to call me Tutti Fruity. He said, God, I don't, I don't like that. I said, well, I said, player, you... <laughs> You know, whatever they want you to do or whatever the name is, you got to do what they say. I said, that's how this works. So he said, well, can you think, can we think of something? And so I sit down and I thought about, I said, I tell you what, how about this? And I told it to Merrill first. I said, all the fly guys will get mad and all the fly girls will be glad. Get ready for Johnny B. Bad. And he said, okay, let's try. And so I went to Dusty and I just told him, I said, sir, I said, if I could, you know, could I run this by you? What do you think about we call him this? And I gave that line to Dusty, and he liked it. He said, yeah, yeah, let's go with that, baby. I like that. <laughs> Did uh, Dusty ever have designs on you maybe joining a booking committee in the future, or was he just trying to help you along with you, like your wrestling IQ? He just helped me. Ain't, wasn't, ain't no black man going to get on no booking committee at that time. <laughs> mm. I think Ernie Ladd might have been the only black guy that ever was like the booker when he was working for Bill Watts. Bill trusted him, and let him did the book, but Jim Crockett and them, they, they wasn't going to be no black man there. With, uh, with that being said, where does Dusty rank on, especially mid-Atlantic and 
WCW, where does Dusty rank of uh, uh, how good the bookers were? I've named a lot of them, but was Dusty your favorite? Number one, mm -hmm. the best, because, I mean, he drew money. He came up with great storylines. I mean, what people wanted to see back in the day in the Crockett days, selling out everywhere we go. You you remember the stuff they did with the horsemen and all that, where they broke Dusty's leg and did stuff. They had great storylines, and he involved me in some of those storylines. So I, I don't think there, nobody was better than Dusty. Kevin Sullivan was right there in the running, okay, because Kevin and, and uh, Dusty, you know, they worked a lot down in Florida together. So, but I'd say Dusty, Kevin Sullivan, and Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Mm. So there was two from Eddie Graham, and Eddie Gilbert would have been Memphis, wouldn't he? So uh, for yes. Jerry Jarrett, so perfect. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I, I, through my whole wrestling career, I never met Jerry Jarrett. Really? Uh, no. He just never passed met away him, as well, didn't he? Yes, yes, he did. I never met him. Uh, there are a lot of guys in the wrestling. They like the. I see Jeff Jarrett. I never did meet. Jerry Jarrett, uh, there was it's a couple other people. I, it'll come to me, but I never all of my whole career, like uh, Melcher, the guy that writes that co uh, wrestling book. I never met him a day in my life. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he'll be coming up later, but he might be. Uh, Dale Fortuno, and uh, I asked you beforehand, and we're just going to sort of not go on about it too much, but this may okay. segue into the story we uh, uh, we discussed uh, off air. Uh, Dale asks, how big was the blade Gary Hart gave you to defend yourself from particular boys of uh, nature, it says. Okay, well, the blade was, they had he had made it and he put it in a little thing. I, I can't describe it, but it was a little cart, looked something like this, and it had the blade inside of it. So I don't know you know, how big it was or nothing, but that's the way it was. It was made where you didn't really know it was a blade. If anybody didn't know it, you could just put it right in your pocket. Cause Gary Hart was known for that. You know, he's known for keeping a blade. Cause I was with him on a show one time in Birmingham, Alabama, and the promoters, you know, started messing up at the end with the money. Talking about they weren't gonna pay us or they was trying to shorten the money or something. And Gary took that knife out and he told him, he said, anybody, you can give me my money right now. Either I'm gonna cut every one of you in here. So he was known for carrying the blade. So, but he made me, I had that blade. I just, it's probably in my house right now. Cause I put <laughs> stuff up like that. I kept that. Yeah. Well, so it's in a drawer somewhere. Just, I mean, that's gotta it's, be real. It's in my, it's in my house. Cause I kept stuff like that, you know, cause I wanted to remember, you know, that, you know, how I got that and what, and what that was all about. Uh, should we talk about why Gary made you a blade in the first place or should we move on? Well, well, I'll, I'll explain it to you. I, I, I was having problems, you know, uh, with Flair, and uh, I guess those people knew it. You know, I guess Gary probably knew what was going on. So he came to me one time, and he told me he made this blade, and he said if Flair kept bothering me, he told me to take that blade and cut his throat. This is my right hand to God. I wouldn't have no reason to lie. And so that's that's how the blade come about. <laughs> you need to find but that Gary, blade. Gary just – Gary didn't – you know, he just didn't appreciate – the way I was being treated, because I wasn't bothering nobody. I'm just doing my job, you know, just like with Lord Nidus, you know, you gonna, you mad at me for doing my job. If I had been such a terrible person, you think Vince would have put me in charge of his company for nine years? If I stayed there nine years and ran the face of the company, I'm doing my job. So you can't tell me you mad at me about my job. He's mad at me of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. We will move on. Uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to ask any more WCW stuff. I'm going to go straight into our first game, Name Association, because uh, I like it, and it always throws up some interesting answers. Now, I'm going to give you a sentence, a description, and you tell me the first person who matches the description that I give you. And the first one is funniest person in the locker room. <laughs> Jesus. You can't say yourself for any of these, by the way. No, well, I wasn't the funniest person in the locker room. I tell you, I think the Iron Sheet. <laughs> he, because he had, he made us all laugh, brother. We, we'd wait on Sheik sometime to come, and a lot of times when we didn't see him or he'd pop up or something, man, everybody was so happy because they knew he was going to give us give us some good Sheik stories. <laughs> I remember one time he cut this promo on Kurt Angle Sheik, and he told, "Oh, you're you're no real champion." I'm the real Olympic champion. You're a douchebag or something. He just kept cussing <laughs> Kurt out. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, we were in Kurt was just dying laughing because he can't you can't say nothing. And we just and, and then we also Sheik would also get on Nikolai Volkov. You know him and Nikolai they come get out of the ring and Sheik would find something that Nikolai did and he's cussing him out about that. Told him he didn't have no driver's light and he couldn't drive. It was just it was amazing. It was great fun <laughs> back there. But I think Sheik was the funniest guy in the locker room. Do you know, Val Venus told me, this is about Bradshaw, so Val Venus said if he was ever, ever bored at a TV taping and wanted some entertainment, he would just follow Bradshaw around the locker room for the day. <laughs> and it'd just be instant entertainment for the entire evening. Was it the same with Sheik? It'd just be just a horde of people following him around. Well, yeah, you would follow him around, you know, because he'd find somewhere where he'd get right in something and he'd start, you know, ragging on it. But J- 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 Val's right about JBL too now. You, he gave you plenty of excitement because back then, <laughs> He messed with everybody. I remember they they made Matt Stryker. They wouldn't even let him dress in the locker room. He had to dress in the janitor's closet. Really? Yeah. A- any particular <laughs> reason? Just or was he just that annoying? They he just come in being a little cocky, so they had to kind of put him in his place. Oh, cool. And that place was the janitor's closet. It seems like. that's where he had to dress. I'm telling you, he they wouldn't let him in the locker room. Next one is last man standing at the bar. JBL and Ron Simmons. Okay, that was an easy one. Um, most beautiful, <laughs> most beautiful diva, women's wrestler, valet, whatever, in real life. Chris Stratus. That name comes up a lot, you know, as well. So you're in good company. <laughs> Kevin Sullivan, in fact, said that not too long ago, I seem to remember. Now, the uh, next one is the biggest bully. Uh, Vader. Purely in the ring, or is this a locker room situation? Just all around, mm-hmm. in the ring and in the locker room. Most bullied. The person that got bullied the most? Yeah, who was picked is on the most, you? yeah. Um, not, uh, not too many people. I think, like I said, I remember Matt Stryker was one of them. Um... I don't remember that. It wasn't too many people that that they picked on back then. Smelliest wrestler. <laughs> Bundy. King Kong Bundy. King, King Kong Bundy. That's, would you believe that's a new name? I've asked that question 80 times. You've never had Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Bundy. Uh, not that you're here. Uh, most dangerous situation oh. you ever... Uh, I'm sorry, did you have another answer for it? Or? No, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say the most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in. Uh, I, I don't guess you'd call it dangerous. I just found myself in a situation when I was refereeing. Uh, I was in the ring with Darren Drozdoff and D'Lo Brown. Yeah. And uh, when D'Lo dropped him on his head, uh, I had never seen anything like that. And that was the first time I'd ever been in the ring with somebody that had an injury. And I walked over to Darren, and I never forget, he looks up at me and he says, Teddy Long, I'm dying, I'm dying. Those were the words that he was saying. And I I was just horrified, man, because, I mean, that was the first time I experienced any of that. So uh, I think that would would probably be it. Yeah. Um, Were referees at that time not given any protocol for injuries of that nature? What'd you say? Uh, So was there no protocol for the referees? So if a, a terrible injury happens in the ring... Were the referees told to do something in particular, or were you just well, flying blind yeah, out well, there? No, you give a signal. If it's really happened, then, you, and then this is the signal that you would give right there. So you're letting everybody know it's real, that he's hurt. So I gave that. If you go back and watch that match, you can see it. You see me give the signal. You can't watch it. It's uh, It was never broadcast, and I believe that match is on a shelf, along with uh, Owen Hart's uh, a few months earlier. Uh, okay. Saying never, never to be viewed, never to be erased, and that's where that match resides. It's never been broadcast. Wow. I, you know what? I was looking at Dark Side of the Ring or something, and they had something on there, and I saw something of that. I did see that because I saw myself. I'm like, yeah, wow, well, I was a referee there, so I did see that somewhere. On I, I was looking at some on Dark Side of the Ring or some, I think, and I saw that. There are photos available. Uh, what do you think? Because uh, we're talking about what do you think contributed to the mat? Uh, sorry, the move uh, going awry was it mistiming? Was it because Dross was wearing a shirt? I think as well that may not have helped. Well, the way if I can remember right, the way I got it, I think you know a lot of guys they oil up before they go out. Okay, 
So the way I got it, I think Dilo had on, you know, a little bit too much oil. And when he picked draws up or something, I think draws just slipped right out of his hand. He wasn't trying to drop him, but I think he was just oiled up or something. That's the way, the kind of the way I got it. Yeah. Uh, Dross passed away not too long ago as uh, yeah. we record this. Um, talk about Dross just as a, a person, because everyone always dwells on his accident, but just Dross as a person. Draws was a great guy. I had a chance to work with him and uh, Prince Albert. You know, they were tag teams. And uh, Draws was just an outstanding guy, man. Great guy. Next question is most unpredictable. Hmm. Most unpredictable, which means you never know what they might do. Mm -hmm. Just I'd have to say JBL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you may be coming up in a few of these, I'll be honest. Uh, nicest person in wrestling? Taker. Great answer. Biggest pothead. <laughs> including me? Yeah, no, no, we're not including you. We're not including you. Uh RVD. There you go. That's a, a fine answer. <laughs> hey, listen, right, I don't I don't know when this is gonna come up again, but uh I had Godfather on actually a couple of years ago and he said uh, Oh well let, yeah, let's put him in there because it's a tie between him and R V D. I don't know. Godfather might might smoke a little more than R V D. I don't know, but it's that's that's pretty pretty that's pretty much a tie. Well he's a big boy, Godfather. He must have bigger lungs. He might be able to just hold more in, I don't know. Oh well, I we man, I smoked with him. We had great times on the road, and look, like I said, every time I see him now, he's always got the gimmick, and uh, we we light up. <laughs> Two things about Godfather from that interview that I want to bring up to you. One, he said a very surprising name for the uh, best roller of joints, and it was Paul Bearer. Does that strike you as correct? Well, I don't know. I never knew uh, Paul Bearer was rolling joints. I didn't even know Paul Bearer smoked. No, he doesn't seem the type. Just looking at him, does he? Yeah, but apparently. yeah. But but that's how that's how a lot of the smokers are. You never know who they are. <laughs> and this is the big one, right? And I'm so glad I remember this because Godfather told me a story about you, and he said that you taught him <laughs> how to run, and he said that you're the king of like running on a treadmill. Cardio, yeah, cardio. And what is the breathing technique that allows people to run for a lot longer? Well, I don't really have no breathing uh, technique. You know what I mean? I've been doing cardio for over 20 years and I do an hour. I can do two hours. I, uh, I I put a bet one time with CM Punk and Kane. We was overseas and they bet me that I couldn't do two hours. So I did this hour, got off, took a piss, jumped right back on and did another hour. So I lost. So I, uh, I think Punk won that bet, I believe. One of them, but anyway, they bet me money that I couldn't do the two hours. In fact, I do the hour cardio right now as of this day. Okay, I still do that. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because my body, I've done it so long to I have trained my body to to want for that. At my age right now, at cardio, I shouldn't even be doing that much. I look at people now that are 19, 20 years old, you know, come on the machine, they're 15, 20 men, they're gone, they're out of there. And I'm still right there. But the body has adjusted. That's what I have to do. If I don't do the hour, I'm not happy. I, I, I'm i just not happy if I don't do that hour. And some days, you know, I have, you know, drag days. You know, I'm dragging a little bit. And I'll my mind will tell me, well, why don't you take a rest? You know, you did it yesterday. You can do it. And I'll get ready and cuss myself out. I'm like, Teddy Long, go fuck yourself. You're going to do this cardio and you're going to do it all. And I, and I leave my mind alone and I do it. How are your knees? And I start bought well, my knees are pretty good. I use the C B D cream now. Oh, yeah. They got good cream. That really helps me a lot. And like I said, Godfather, I started him doing cardio. He dropped the weight and got all that weight off. Me and him, I'd make him get up every morning. We hit that gym and so and and he after a while he started understanding the importance of that cardio. And so he kept right on doing it and he's doing it today. Yeah, indeed as well. Uh next one yeah. is the most memorable thing you saw happen on an aeroplane. Hmm. Um, well, I wasn't on the plane ride from hell. I wasn't on that plane. Uh, I don't think I anything. Well, I, I remember one time me and D. Von Dudley, I used to mess with him all the time. And so I'd always act, you know, like he was my like I was uh, his girl and he was my my husband. So one time he had beat he got on the plane and he was on early before me and everybody knew I'd mess with him. So they come and smarten me up. They said, Devon's already on the plane, I said, go get him. So I got right on the plane and I walked right up to him. Girl, 
Why did you let me oversleep like that? Why did you leave me in the hotel? You knew I had to get my clothes on. You didn't lay my gown out. You didn't do that. Oh, and the people were just looking at me. <laughs> they were like, this man is going crazy. So finally I did that for a while. And then I looked and d one he's just, he, he can't say nothing. He's so embarrassed. And so finally, you know, I stopped and I said something to him in my real voice. I said, okay, so now you ain't going to say nothing. <laughs> and so the people, all the people started laughing. But that was the most fun thing I did on an airplane. Did he sell it? Or was he just like stoic, stone? Oh, he, he 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 was stoic. He did because he 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 couldn't say nothing. I I didn't even give him time to respond. I just kept browbeating him. You know, <laughs> you just left me. You did. You knew better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a, that. People just dying laughing, man. Uh, next one is most reckless wrestler who would just throw them punches and kicks and slams with uh, reckless abandon. Ah, she had a lot of guys. <laughs> I think Sid Vicious was one of the reckless ones. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, golly, Sid. I think Vader. You had to put him back in that too. He was, he was, he he was pretty reckless. Um, sometimes I think, uh, golly, man, I, that that that's about it. It was a lot of reckless guys. I just can't remember. You know, none of them who they were now. Smoothest. Uh, okay. Kofi oh, Kingston. Kofi Kingston. I was thinking about him. He he would kind of potato guys a little bit. You know, okay. a lot of guys didn't really want to. A lot of guys didn't really want to work with him. They had they started complaining about him. So uh, he he was kind of reckless too. Was he? Uh, he come around. Yeah, I was going to say he's a pretty small guy in the land of the giants. Was he just trying to get his point across and? Work big. Well, I don't think he meant to do it. I think he was just he just didn't know no better. Or some <laughs> I, I have no idea. But he was trained in a good school. He come out of deep south. So he was really he was in a good school. Um next one is most miserable wrestler to be around. Always had a frown on. <laughs> most miserable. Uh probably I think Viscera, God rest his soul, he's gone now too. He was kind of, kind of most miserable. He wasn't. He just. He was happy sometimes. Sometimes he wasn't. Um, yeah, I think Viscera might have been one. Uh, there was a lot of other guys that were miserable to him to be around. But yeah, man, this is so far back in the day, man. Like I said, I didn't meet too many guys in WWE when I started there in WWF. You know, it was during the Attitude Era, so everybody was really on top of the game and, you know, really having a good time. So it wasn't really nobody miserable then. Biggest ladies, man. Uh, the biggest la- I'd have to say uh, Godfather. Really? That is a name we've never had. Yeah, I'd have to say him because they girls would always come flocking to him because they'd always want to try to get on the whole train. <laughs> and he'd have and he'd have these girls. I remember mean, one time, this girl came to his hotel room and she, you know, a lot of girls, they knew golf out of smoke. So they'd bring him smoke. So one girl, she brought him the smoke and she thought she was going, you know, have a good time with him. So he takes the weed and he puts her right out of his room. <laughs> <laughs> Never give a time of day, bro. Took the bud. Then he told me about the bud. I don't think it was no good or something. He called it Negro bud or something. <laughs> he said, yeah, she brought me this Negro bud or something. I had to end up throwing it away. <laughs> but yeah, some sudden weed, he wouldn't smoke it. Uh with with that being said, who were the uh boys who may uh who who would uh, most obviously be sniffing around the hose in the locker room? <laughs> oh man. Who was that back? Let's see. Godfather didn't mess with him too much. Let's see. It uh it really nobody oh i know uh uh we had we had this thing one time we was in macon georgia and i remember godfather we had the whole train so they had these girls that came in they were from a strip club so we had steve blackman steve blackman was in on it so they, the girls wanted money so they came in the locker room so they just wanted to do it you know they're doing a to z but they wanted to pay wanted everybody to pay them so I think I ended up, they sent me down there and I ended up going in the room. So I get my clothes, get my pants down and they look at me and they tell me 200 bucks. I'm like, oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong room. So I put my pants back up and left. I wasn't finna give them, you know, I'm cheap. I ain't finna pay for nothing, you know? <laughs> so, but that, that was a good story there, man. These girls were, were from the strip club and also alias prostitutes. Uh, 
So <laughs> was it a weekly thing then, or did you have to like feel out whether no. they'd be receptive? No, you have to wait and see. That wasn't a weekly thing. We just happened to find out about it. Well, the girls let us know, hey, you guys want a good time? You know, y'all got money? So you have to know. We, didn't, we really didn't know because a lot of girls, they would bring in, you know, they just do the whole train and they'd leave. That was it. Man, I didn't know that. I've never really considered that possibility that there might be after-party favors going on at the same time. I oh, thought, yeah. I mean, in a tr economic transaction kind of way. is uh, That's oh, my innocence, no. what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you ever talk to Godfather, he'll tell you that story. Oh, I need to have Godfather back on, let me tell you. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple more. Uh, loudest spot caller. <laughs> loudest spot caller. I guess that would probably... I, you know what? I, I really, I really never heard guys. You know, you know, everybody was so professional. You know, you could I, by me being in the business, you could look and you could tell when there was a spot being called. But I never really heard one. You know, really out loud, unless you unless you were in the ring there with them. But I never heard anything out loud. But you know, you would all sometimes you could see a guy lean and go right to the guy's ear. Then, you know, for me, for people that were smart, we knew what he was doing. He's calling the spot. A lot of people didn't knew that, but I see what you're saying. A lot of guys, they'll call him and you can, people on the front row can hear. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of, I've heard of that happening, but I never did experience that. And I never did see anybody do that. Uh, the best referee ever. I'd say Earl Hebner. Do you know, I thought you were going to say Tommy Young because everyone generally says Tommy. Well, I was going to say, you know, it, it, it's, that's a toss-up between Tommy Young and Earl Hebner. I had a chance to work with both of those guys, but I worked with Earl a lot more than I did with Tommy Young. So, but between those two, I mean, it, it didn't get no better than that than me and referees. I think Earl was a little more animated. Tommy was kind of more laid back. Mm. Uh, hardest deliverer of weapon shots. Who'd lay it in? JBL. There you go. I knew JBL would be coming up again. Uh, you ever see that clothesline? Uh, do you know what? Funny, on um, one of the podcasts that me and Dutch did very recently, maybe even last week, we watch Bradshaw clothesline Dutch, and it's the lightest clothesline you'll ever see in your life. He goes in with his body, swings the arm around him, protects him like no nobody's business. But then well, he, we took care, he yeah. took care of Dutch, okay? He didn't take care of everybody. No, no. <laughs> uh, Jake the Snake Roberts apparently was uh, a famous one who used to get it quite a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jake's a good guy too, man. Most legit tough badass. Hmm. Brock Lesnar. Yeah, that's an easy one, I suppose, isn't it? And we've already talked about several of these, but I suppose in the locker room, aside from Hawk and Steve Williams, most memorable backstage fight. I think Eddie Guerrero, God rest his soul, and Kurt Angle. They had a match in the ring, and it started in the ring, and when they finished then as soon as they got out of the ring and they got backstage, they started it again. What was the issue? I don't. I have no idea. If something happened in the ring, I think that might have been a bad spot call or something was called and it didn't go right. But you got two guys like Kurt and Eddie Guerrero, you know, that are real pros, and they when they get out there, they want to give it 100%. So once, you know, something messes up, you know, those guys take that real serious. So I think it just something happened in the ring and – like I said, but they came in the back and they settled it back there. Uh, was there a winner or was it pulled apart before? I think they pulled them apart. Yeah. I think so. So we're going to move on to the WWF now. Um, before we get on to all the questions that fans have sent in, you leave WCW in 1996. You're not seen again until late 1998 in the WWF. How come you left WCW? Uh, they fired me. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I left there. I think, um, I'm not sure. I don't know whether this happened or not, but I somebody told me that uh, it was Magnum TA that said something to Dusty about me or something. Now, I don't know whether that to be true or not. That's just the way I got it, and that's how I that's how I got fired. But let me tell you a story about show you how good God is. I got fired, and so I was working, I was working out at this gym in Atlanta, at Bally's Gym. I went in this gym one day and there was a guy in that gym and he recognized me and he walked over to me and he started talking to me and he told me, he said he was Kip Fry's nephew or cousin or something like that. Never saw this guy a day in my life. And I told him, I said, well, I'm not there now. I said, uh, I got fired. I said, I'm not, 
you know, with WCW anymore. He said, why did they do that? I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, Teddy Long, I tell you what, man, I'm I'm Kip Fry's nephew or something. He said, I'm going to call Kip, man. Don't you worry. You're going to get you're going to get your job back. I didn't pay that no attention, man. You know, I'm like, this guy working out with me in the gym. I don't even know him, you know. And I swear to God to you, man, within a week, Kip Fry called me back. And I went back to work for WCW. And plus, they paid me money that they owed me after they fired me. And I never saw that guy never again. I went to that gym every day to thank him. Never saw him again. <laughs> How, how did like, you write Kit Fry? It's like an angel. <laughs> how did you write mm -hmm. Kit Fry as a boss then? Because he was only there for a well, few months. I didn't. I don't. I couldn't rate him because I didn't know him. I, I seen him, you know, before I got fired. No, well, no. When I got fired, Kit Fry wasn't even there. Kit Fry was the guy that I, when I went back, Kit Fry was the guy that brought me back and gave me my job back and 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 gave and paid me. He was uh, quite well known for being very generous with contracts. Was he uh, good to you on the pay front? Yeah, yeah, he, he took care of me, but like I said, he was one of these guys that didn't just just didn't know, you know, just start giving away a lot of money. And that's the way Ted Turner and them was too. They gave away a lot of money, man, when they first took over that company. But that was people that came in that were looking out for all their friends and taking care of all their friends. And I remember they had the iron sheet there, and he they wouldn't, you know, they was making so much money and it just having a having such a good time till they fired Sheik and they didn't forgot about they fired him. And Sheik stayed home for a year and and made three grand a week for a year, and they didn't even they had no idea that he was still getting paid. <laughs> and I think that also happened to Lenny Poffer too. He was getting a check too from him, and he never worked. I saw him there one time. Really, I didn't even know he'd yeah. ever turned up to a WCW show. He he was there one, uh, yeah, one time I think, and they kept paying him. He was another guy that was getting a check. I think he was getting three or four, three or five grand a week and. Like I said, he worked one time. Well, yeah, 150000 a year he was making between, like, for four or five years. Mm-hmm. It's like, how can... We're all on the lookout for a job like that, and it only seems to happen to a select few, you know? Well, you see, it wasn't their money. So it's easy to do something with other people's money. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You see? Yeah. yeah if, if you sign in a check with a rubber stamp and it, next one, it's easy, isn't it? Um, Brandon Mueller has asked, I want to hear about your road stories riding with Ron and JBL and get his side of the story about being cheap like Mick Foley and others. Ha ha. Well, I, it's not being, well, I guess you say cheap. Okay. It's Cause frugal. I am. I, Careful. <laughs> I am cheap. Uh, I, you know, like I said, back in the day, man, you know, you didn't make a whole lot of money. So you had to kind of watch your money. So I used to do, <laughs> I used to do tell stuff like I'd wait till they get to the toll booth and, you know, it'd be my time to pay the toll. But, you know, you can't sit at the toll because you got traffic. You know, you got cars behind you. So I'd go to looking and searching, you know, like I'm looking for my money and it's taking me a while, but we can't hold up the traffic. So John or Run end up paying the toll so we could keep on going. So uh, I never did find my money. So they cussed me <laughs> for about 30 minutes, you know, and oh, God, they cussed me. But I never did. I, yeah, I think I ended up paying one time. <laughs> <laughs> what, did they, like, pin you down and force you? Or... Oh, yeah, they made me pay. They wouldn't do nothing until I paid. <laughs> of, uh, of someone, because we mentioned Lanny Poffo, uh, Mick Foley was mentioning this question. There's others like Owen Hart and Rick Rogers, who we interviewed not too long ago, who are, uh, if there's a Mount Rushmore of uh, frugal, careful with their money wrestlers, who would it be? Uh, I would say JBL. He's real careful with his money. Really? He's, yeah, man. He's got stocks and stuff. You know what I mean? So he's 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 real smart, man. He he may be that character on TV, but uh, but uh, he has a lot of knowledge about stocks and bonds and stuff like that, man. So he's a real really good guy to talk to about investing your money. But JBL was real safe with his money. Uh, Ron's another guy that was you know safe you know with his money. Um. I guess you could see a lot. Maybe I think Austin, you know, Steve, you know, he was another guy, you know, you didn't see him splurging and, you know, doing a whole lot of fancy stuff, you know? So I think he was one that was, uh, you know, safe with his money. Who would uh, go that one step further and, you know, rent the worst motels or sleep in the car or, you know, uh, there's an old story that <laughs> Rick Rogers says isn't true that he used to steal packets of ketchup from restaurants <laughs> and make himself ketchup soup. Uh, what what are some of the uh, money saving uh, extremes that you've heard of in the road? Uh, I tell you this story. Um, 
Bugsy McGraw, people may not remember him, but Bugsy McGraw was a guy like that. Like I said, he we didn't make a lot of money back in the Crockett days. So one time, me and Earl Hebner, we was uh we stopped somewhere and we went in this grocery store so we could get some food. So what we had to eat then when we dropped putting the ring up, we'd go and get a loaf of bread and we'd get uh some sauce meat or lunch meat, you know, so we could make sandwiches. So we went in this grocery store one time that in Charlotte. And so I look up and there's Bugsy in the aisle. Well, we see Bugsy. And so what Bugsy is doing, Bugsy's got a loaf of bread and he's got a thing of lunch meat in his buggy. And Bugsy is, while he's pushing the buggy like he's shopping, he's making him a sandwich. And all he does, he makes that sandwich and he continues to eat <laughs> while he's rolling that buggy down like he's shopping. And he made a couple of sandwiches. He ate them. And that was, and then once he got through, he put the buggy down and left out. <laughs> I like that. What's, yeah. what's the most you've, um, what's the least you've spent in a week on the road? Let's say in the WWF. <laughs> Not much. Uh it's in a week. Let's see. I had hotels and food and stuff. Um, I don't know. Maybe five hundred a week. Maybe with hotels and rental cars and food. That's not and no toll uh, bridge. Uh, no toll. Paper. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to WWE and doing some managerial stuff. So uh, I can't even pronounce guys. Peng Peng Design. Uh, I want to hear about Rodney Mack. That kid had potential. Also, it was funny using his theme song to troll the wrestling fans. And uh, hopefully this will lead into a story about how you end up in a match with Rodney and Chris Nowinski in Newcastle. But uh, for Rodney Mack uh, uh, to start off with. Uh, Rodney Mack, great guy, man. Uh, him and Jazz uh, love them to death. They're running their own company. It's out in Texas. It's called Dog Pound Championship Wrestling. Uh, they also have a wrestling school out there, too. They train people, and they're, they're, they're really good people. Uh, and so the way I met Rodney, uh, you know, like I said, Vince put us together. He started the White Boy Challenge. So we started doing that. Also, D'Lo Brown would have been a part of that, but Vince, something happened right there. He just wasn't happy with D'Lo. So ended up, if you can remember, you in me and Rodney Mack, we ended up putting D'Lo in the trunk in the trunk of a car, and that was the end of it. We never did see D'Lo no more because I think we went out that night and we did a promo. I did a promo or something, and I come back, and Vince said to me about D'Lo, he didn't have a, not a on a soul or not a soul bone in his body or something not a black bone or something in his body i think the promo he was cutting was just too white and so vince said he had no soul or something like that he didn't have a black bone in his body or something he said and that's and then we ended up then that's when we ended up putting him in the trunk of the car and then it was just me and rodney mack and then so on after a while then mark henry came in we had added him to the team and christopher nowinski we did a little something with him, but uh, he didn't. He didn't last too long. You were uh, telling me off air, and I said, "Oh, you've got to save it for the podcast." But um, you wrestled uh, with Chris Nowinski and Rodney Mack against the Dudley Boys and Spike Dudley in Newcastle for one of the uh, British UK only uh, pay per views. I really miss, and I think a lot yeah. of people here miss. But tell us the story about how you ended up in a match. Well, I didn't know anything about it. I think uh, Bubba Ray Dudley, I think Bubba, that was kind of Bubba's idea. And I think he went to Stephanie and talked to her about it because she was at over, overseas at that time. So that, I think, was Bubba's idea. I'm not sure. But anyway, and after I ended up in that match, I think it, Vince wasn't there and Stephanie was over and she was in charge. And Vince was pretty hot about that because I think they beat me. And right at that time, Vince didn't want anybody putting their hands on me. You know what I mean? Because he, I, I'm, I'm like, I was going to end up being there. He didn't want people to take my heat away right then. And them beating me up or putting their hands on me, then that's going to take my heat immediately. So he was really hot about that. He, he, he really, he didn't like that. So I ended up, I think he said, talk to Stephanie about it. But I remember Stephanie coming to me and apologizing to me about doing that. You know, she said, my daddy didn't like that. And so that's that you know that's how that went down. Yeah, uh, how were you? Because obviously you've only wrestled a few matches, really. How does your body absorb bumps when you're just not used to it? Well, it didn't bother me at all. You know, at, at that time, you know, I was at, at a younger age, so I didn't mind taking the bumps. I was having fun, man. It didn't bother me whatsoever. And then, like I said, I had a chance to work a little bit in the ring, you know, and take some bumps even before I started doing that because. Uh, Doing with the indie guys before I got in w WCW and NWA, I worked with a lot of indie promotions. And so I started, you know, in the ring with a lot of indie guys, you know, taking bumps then. So the bumps didn't didn't really bother me. I never got, got hurt or anything. 
uh, apart from like a WrestleMania or something, was the UK tours the most lucrative? Did you get paid the best for being yes. over here? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, the UK always paid best. Yeah, we. I love going overseas because you knew you are going to get a good paycheck. Yeah, and then the crowds are, haven't seen you in yeah. so long, so you get a better reaction as well. Yeah, oh, they were super nice, man. I remember one time, man, and this is a true story. If Nick, if Nick Patrick, he could tell you this story. We was in uh, Italy somewhere. I forget where it was, and I went to buy something, and me and Nick went in this shopping mall, and uh, the people saw me in this shopping mall, and they recognized me, and boy, and they started. We had to run. I had to run, jump in the car, man. They was coming after me, not to hurt me, and then, but they were, like, kind of mobbing me, trying to get pictures and autographs and stuff, and I mean, that was uh, it was amazing to me. I ain't never had nobody chasing me, you know, so... And I go back and I think, well, you know, I was over then, and I didn't didn't even know how over I was. Yeah, <laughs> a beetle then. So you you had like a like a microcosm of knowing what it felt like to be like a rock star or something. Yeah, yeah. Nick Packer will tell you that story, man. Yeah. I'm the, them somebody chasing me, you know, man, <laughs> <laughs> unreal. Uh, I'm gonna move on now. Um, Eddie Guerrero memories, and I'm going to specifically bring up something. I interviewed Melina uh, Perez very recently, and she said that there was a sort of, uh, before Eddie passed and after Eddie passed, as far as cohesion in the locker room, because she said before Eddie passed, everyone was very friendly. It was like one big family. And then after he passed, then all these like cliques, all these groups started to form in the back, all these factions, and it wasn't as a cohesive a locker room as previously. Is that how you remember it, or is that true in your recollection? Well, no, I don't remember it like that. Um, you know, uh, I don't think there was, I mean, maybe to her it might have been, you know, maybe th that maybe happened to her, but I don't think there was any problems in the locker room. with Eddie was a great guy, man, nice guy. Everybody got along with Eddie, you know. I talked to him and stuff, and I remember one time I spoke to Eddie about one of his matches or something, something happened, and I just happened to, you know, mention to him, and he took that real serious, you know. He's like, God, damn, Ted, you're right, Teddy. I should have done that. I should have done that, and I'm – you know, I was just making small talk, you know, just that, you know, I see something and I and, and people like Eddie Guerrero, you could talk to. You can't go to every guy and tell them about the mask because they don't want to hear it or they think that you don't know what you're talking about and you shouldn't be telling them anything. Mm -hmm. But Eddie, uh, Chris Benoit, another guy, those two guys, Ray Mysterio was guys that I could talk to and, and you know, and, and say stuff, you know, and they, they understood because they knew I knew. But a lot of guys didn't think I knew shit, so they didn't even want to hear it. Is it is it just every generation that just never wants to hear what the older guard has to say, or is it different these days than it was back when you broke in? As far as uh, the old guard I, imparting knowledge and the young guys not taking it or taking the advice. Well, I think it's different now. A lot of guys don't want to take the advice from the from the older guys. You know, they they don't want to hear it. Um, and you can see a lot of guys that you know when they go down to NXT, they're gonna get it right. You know what I mean? Because they got guys there, Shawn Michaels, uh, Terry Taylor, Larry Zabisco, and people, you know, that really know how this thing works. And my thing was this right here with the young talent. Uh, when I broke in, you know, when you walked in the locker room, you know, the guys, you'd walk around and you'd introduce yourself and you'd shake everybody's hand. These guys come in now, they will say not one word to you. Because uh, I went back to do stuff for Raw. The last thing I went to do, the draft for SmackDown and Raw. And a uh, few guys come, but wouldn't know it. Some guys walk right by you and never even speak to you. So, you know, it's a lot different now. The young guys don't want to really take no advice. And so my thing is this. I say this about a lot of guys that are still in the business say, and have retired as so. I think that instead of them working out here on these indies and stuff, why wouldn't you go down to NXT and try and get your job there and show these young kids exactly how this works? And I said that, you know, about a lot of guys, you know, that are still out here, you know, trying to go. I mean, go talk to Hunter or somebody, tell them, give you a job, then show these kids exactly how this works. This is about drawing money. And a lot of young kids don't understand that part about it. But they just want to get out there because they bought some new tights or some new boots and they just want to show that off. You know, that don't buy, that don't sell tickets. And I never forget, Vince McMahon told us in a meeting one time, he says, how can you go to the bank and draw any money out when you ain't putting on in there? So what he's telling you, if you ain't sold any tickets here, how can I pay you? So it's understandable. So that's why I think a lot of the older guys should just take their time, go down to NXT, man, and start helping those young guys and train them and show them how this really works, how to draw money. Because this is a business, and I learned that from Vince. Speaking of that, I mean, you've been in the business for just over 40 years now. What are the biggest changes that have happened in the 40 years that you've seen? Uh, well, I guess cable TV, 
uh, social media and all that, you know, back in the day, you know, there was no, you know, uh, social media, no internet and all that stuff. So with all that change, uh, I think that's helped the business a lot because now the bit you with the TV, internet and all this stuff, you know what I mean? The product can really get advertised and get out there like it's supposed to be. Because as you know, at one particular time, they you, wasn't nobody going overseas. It wasn't coming over there to, to bring wrestling, you know, because they felt like it wouldn't draw. People, you know, over there were different and they didn't want to see the product. So now they understand that the money is everywhere. So, you know, that's what I, I think should happen is the older guys now should just take time and try to help the young kids out. It's funny, in the mid-90s WWF, it was actually the overseas tours like here in Germany that was bolstering up the company, you know, when it was in its lowest ebb. And it was yeah. the overseas tours that were the only place they were making proper money. Right. Yeah, I, I love when we went overseas because we know we had a good paycheck there. And then you had 14 days over there, you know, so that was really good. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of guys used to come back, you know, they go stay uh, half of the tour and then they go back. Well, I never did get a chance to go back. I had to stay both tours. You know, I stayed the whole 14 days. So, but was a good check, good payday. Now, uh, you've hinted at this a couple of times. I'm actually going to ask about Johnny Ace in a minute, but uh, before we do, uh, quite a couple, uh, quite a couple, quite a few people had written in about Wrestlers Court. Now, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times before. I do a <laughs> podcast with Dutch Mantel. Dutch Mantel mm -hmm. invented Wrestlers Court. Now, originally, it was just uh, a tool to wind up The Undertaker. Just for whatever reason he could think of, bring a charge and f do whatever, just to amuse themselves. How did Wrestlers well, Court change over the years? Well, Wrestlers Court never changed. It wasn't nothing to amuse uh, amuse people. When you went to Wrestlers Court, you, there was a reason. Uh, they had me go to Wrestlers Court for selling Viagra. So Taker was the judge, and I was also, uh, Mae Young, God rest her soul, was my lawyer. And the way that I lost my case is that when Mae Young was defending me, she didn't say Viagra. She said Niagara. She called it Niagara <laughs> instead of Viagra. Oh, yeah. So, and that's how I lost my case. So I ended up in Russell's court by, I had a fine I had to pay, which the fine was I had to buy chicken and beer for two weeks for JBL and some other people. <laughs> so how much did that run you back? Oh, God. You know, with me being cheap, that got me. Because <laughs> I, I had to buy a lot of chicken <laughs> and a lot of beer. <laughs> So if uh, uh, you were in wrestler's court, let's say if I was in wrestler's court, how would I best, before it started, how uh, how would I make uh, the odds get stacked in my favor beforehand? Well, you might have did something that you shouldn't have done. I think they, I, they might have took Matt Stryker to wrestler's court too. Oh, really? I think, <laughs> yeah, I think they might have. I think he was one of the guys that might have went. I'm not sure. But anyway, if you'd done something, you know, that uh, was really kind of bad there that you needed to go to court, then we'd go get Taker and let him know, hey, you got to be the judge. We got to bring so-and-so to wrestler's court. Did uh, Taker accept bribes? I don't know. <laughs> huh. I'm sure he did, but I don't know. <laughs> he wouldn't take one for me. I didn't have a big enough bribe. That probably what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't give him enough beer and chicken. I didn't give, yeah. <laughs> uh, how many wrestlers' courts were you not in, but how many were you in the audience for? Uh, mostly all of them. When they had wrestlers' court, everybody went to wrestlers' court, whether you were in it or not. You know, you had to, you you were part of the the, the audience. Mm -hmm. So I was I w I went to mostly all of them. Uh, having said that, let's go back to your wrestler's court then. So, uh, Viagra. Now, what was the big issue with you selling Viagra in the locker room that ne necessitated a wrestler's court? <laughs> well, they I guess they wanted me to give it. Excuse me. I guess they wanted me to give it to them. You know what I mean? I didn't give it. You know, and, I used, and I used to get them free, too. I didn't never tell anybody. <laughs> but at the time, you know, the Viagra had just started. So, a lot of guys, you know, weren't really smart to it. So, Viscera, this is a true story right here, brother. Now, uh, God rest his soul, I started selling them to Viscera, and Viscera, Viscera would take them and didn't even have a girl around. He just was amazed at what they'd done for him. This is true. He looked one day, <laughs> he, he took one and he kept, he told me, he said, Teddy Long, he said, I just kept looking at my shit and I kept saying, who shit is this? Who shit is this? Because <laughs> right. he said he just couldn't believe, you know, he was having this big erection like that, you know. So Victor used to take him just to take him, man. It was unreal. Uh, oh, I was going to ask you a question, but I, I think you might want to keep someone's people's privacy here. But uh, who, okay. who else would who else would make purchase? Who was regular customers of yours? Um, let's see. 
not to, uh, golly, not too many guys. I didn't have too many customers. I just had most of the guys. I didn't really. I sold to a few guys, but most of the guys that were with me, sometime I just pass them along. I just give them away because I had a bunch of them. But I didn't have a whole lot of customers. I just had a few guys that would come. Sometimes they'd be in a rush or they had to pick up a girl or something. And they'd like, you know, wonder why I'm like, I'd have one right there handy. And I always said to guys, you don't take Viagra because you need it. You take it because you can. <laughs> it's like a boost. It's like if you drive, put regular gas in your car, you're going to get poor performance. If you put premium gas in your car, you're going to get outstanding performance. So when you take the Viagra, you're outstanding. I need to try it since I've never tried it. Well, no. try it. Okay, I'll report back to you. I'll tell you how it goes. Yeah, yeah, uh, and 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 tell me what your girl thinks about it. I, I, don't don't tell her. Well, see if she knows the difference. Yeah, you know, well, she'll know, and you let her tell you. <laughs> yeah, don't tell her. Don't tell her you took nothing. You do. You just take it and go in, and and she'll be looking at you like. You you what what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> <laughs> I'll report back to you. I'll report back to you. I promise. All right. You. Uh, All right. You do. Next question is now we've uh, you've mentioned this a couple of times beforehand, and uh, anyway, this this will be the sort of like grievance airing portion, I suspect. But who did you prefer as a WWE talent relations head, Jim Ross or Johnny Ace? Uh, I'd rather work under Jim Ross. You know, instead of working on the law night, law night is like I said, man. I, I cannot believe this man, man. He was, he was, he he's one of the worst people on this planet. Him and Mark Arana were the worst. Mark Arana said to me one time, and Mark Arana is in charge of talent relations. He's the guy that give out legends deals. That's where you go through talent relation. Do you know that idiot walked? I asked him about my legends deal, and he said to me like I didn't know, cause he thought I didn't know. He says to me, you don't have one. I, you're the guy to give them out. And you're going to ask me, do I have one? That's what he said to me. And But he thought I was just that dumb that I, cause I played the dumb role. Cause if you let them know, then they would have got me a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So that's, and so I just stayed, I just played the game. You know, I said, no, no, Mark, I, I don't have one. Then he had me call a couple of people up in the, uh, whoever he said call somewhere in the office and they were supposed to take care of it. I called this woman one time and that lady told me, Teddy Long, I'm sorry. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. So he never even called that person. So they never intend, they were supposed to give me that, but they never intended to. Where does, um, where do the issues with Johnny stem from then? Cause I suspect you knew him from WCW times. Right. I brother, I, I was shocked to know how he felt about me because he'd always come up grinning and laughing and, Hey, Teddy, uh, good to see you. Glad you could make come back, you know, make it back here and all that. And, you know, and just to find out, you know, that what he done to me for no reason, just because of, cause I say I've done my job. If I hadn't done my job, I wouldn't have been there. So you can't say it's that. But he called, he tried to get people to get to take my place. He brought in uh, this girl. I forget her name now. She came in. Tiffany, I think she came in and was my assistant in ECW. Mm -hmm. And that girl came to me and told me, she says, Lord and I just brought me in to take your job, Teddy, because me and her got cool. And I tried to help her with her promos and stuff. I was nice to her. And so she came and told me that. She said, he brought me in here to take your job. He brought uh, Christopher Nowinski. He was another one. Uh, Palmer was the Palmer Cannon guy. Yeah, yeah. When he came, he brought him in to, to take my job. But nobody, there's no... It's only one Teddy Long. It's just that simple. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was unreal, man, what that man did to me. D didn't you have a match with him once? Yeah, yeah, I had a match with him one time, and I went over in that match, so it was, you know, I guess he hated to do that, but, I mean, that's what Vince wanted. Did uh, any chance of potato or two flu? In that no, <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't that long. <laughs> Fair enough then. Uh, I'm going to ask one more thing about Johnny, and uh, I'm sure you'll know that last year he was released with uh, extreme prejudice, it seemed like that, from the company shortly before Vince would take his retirement in quote-unquote uh, quotations. Uh, with that being said, did Johnny have a reputation of sniffing around all the female talent and maybe putting some of them in compromising positions where you say, hey, you know, if you go out with me, uh, it uh, well, might go well for your career. Well, I've heard that. And uh, I, like I said, I've never really seen it outright. You know what I mean? I've never seen him really approach one of the girls like that. But I saw him 
in bars and stuff. And I saw when he get get to drinking a little bit, how fresh he got with a lot of guys. I saw that in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. We was there and he was in the bar and I saw him after he was drinking, how he was plopping, you know, all over the girls, the girls that were in the bar. So I don't know that right offhand, but I certainly believe it. Yeah. So was, was it like hushed whispers at the time or oh yeah, sus- suspicion, well, basically? He used his power to to gain more than he was supposed to gain. Okay. He used his power for his own self too. We shall move on to the GM role as well. And Gerard Sloan has written, he was great as SmackDown GM, did he ever think, or was considered for GM authority roles on Raw? And does an on-screen authority figure have any creative input behind the scenes regarding certain characters or storylines? Um, With the GM role, I didn't even know I was going to get that role until I got ready to walk out on TV. They kept that <laughs> kayfabe, okay? They didn't tell me anything. When uh, when I first started, they were going to put me in that role. I, no, when I first started there, Vince, they, they, the writers came to me and told me they wanted me to be like Don King. Okay. So I'm like, I, I don't really know how to be like Don King, but, you know, I couldn't say nothing. But so whatever you guys say, I guess I'll have to go start watching Don King and see how that works. But I basically just went on the TV and just started doing my own thing. I started saying, saying play up. I got that from my dog. I had a, a Labrador retriever and his name was boss. And every time boss would be in my way or something, I'd come around, get moved, go out the way, play up, get out the way, play up. <laughs> and I just, just playing with my dog with it. And so when I went to TV, I just started doing it on TV. The way I got the dance is I got that from my grandson. And the way I got that is when he was about two years old, we bought this Walker and we put him in the walker. And every time we put him in the walker, he would just pop up and down just like that. So at that time, we were taping SmackDown on Tuesdays and then it would air on Friday night. So when I get back home on Friday nights, I'd come to I'd get him, you know, and pull him up to the TV. We'd watch the show back. I said, look, 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 I'm doing your dance. And that's how I didn't think no more about it. So I went to TV and I just started doing it, but I was doing it for him. And one day I got ready to walk out and Vince stands up and he says, do that dance, do that dance. I'm I'm like, what dance? And he started doing it. (laughs) And then I, and then then I, and Jack Lanza told me that God rest his soul. He told me, Vince, love that dance. God damn it. Keep doing that. And that's, that's how the dance started. With uh, so many people have written questions and I'm going to sort of like shove them all into one uh, giant question. Right. So uh, one-on-one with the undertaker has become a meme that's still on the internet that still lives on how many i'll tell you how that i'll tell you how that started okay um that wasn't something that i came up with or nothing i remember one time we was in madison square garden and stephanie went out to introduce somebody and when she come back vince was telling her you know he wanted her to put more emphasis on the person's name you know he was saying like when you introduce uh john william you know what i mean put some emphasis on that and I was just standing back listening, didn't say a word. So when I started going out to introduce the Undertaker, I thought I remembered what Vince said, make that name mean something. So that's how I started one on one with the Undertaker. And that's how that all that come about, because I was remembering what Vince said. How long did it take for the audience to catch on that it was always going to be the Undertaker and they like chant along with you? Well, they just, I did it for a couple of times. And, you know, once I started doing it, then people, you know, they got, got wing of it. So I could say one-on-one and they hit it. They say Undertaker before I could even get it out. <laughs> <laughs> so they caught on really quickly then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they did. Uh, same with the tag team matches. Obviously, it's the other thing that you're famous for, making tag team matches. Four, and let me say six, this. Eight, ten. I, I want to bring this to your attention too. Now, Please. take a win in the Hall of Fame, Okay. I, and I guarantee, I know it was Lord Knight who blocked me, didn't bring me. How can I not go back and be a part of Undertaker's Hall of Fame ceremony with one-on-one with The Undertaker? How can I not go back and be a part of that? Oh, so you didn't get an invite or anything? Nothing. And that was, I'm telling you, it was Lord Knight's. I guarantee you. Because he didn't want me to get that fame or that that shine, as we call it. You know what I mean? I don't work that no more. You don't need to be on this TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We should talk more about Johnny. So we'll save that for a part I two. Know, if we do a part no, two. no, I don't want to talk no more. <laughs> no, about no, no, it. no, let it. We'll save he, it. He's gone. He's gone from the company. Good riddance. <laughs> I hope I never see him again. 
Uh, same with the tag team match. Actually, obviously, you're famous and for creating was, the tag team matches. But and like, that was another thing when, with the tag team matches. That was part of the emphasis. You know what I mean? You know, when I'd make tag teams, I could tag team match. You know, and that was part. I remember what Vince said: make it mean, yeah. make that mean something. And that's how all that started. What, what, I'm just doing what that man liked, and I, that's how I kept my job because I made him happy. So basically, you're doing these things, and I suspect that Vince is picking up on it, the writing team's picking up on it, and then it becomes your thing. So I, I suspect all credit goes to you for making those two things well-known and famous. Nobody never gave me that credit. Nobody never came to me and told me and mm-hmm. said, hey, Teddy Long, this, you know, never. Oh, uh, what was it in creative? <laughs> um no, uh, Dutch always had a different saying, but it doesn't work in this, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, I'm sorry, I've brought the <laughs> podcast to a, a, to a halt there with that music. That's anyway, all right. Next question is, and I want to know about this. Is it true that Bobby Lashley was jealous of you being in a storyline with uh, Crystal Marshall at the time? I think so. I didn't. He didn't tell me that. You know, I got that through the boys, listening to the boys through rumors, because I don't... Bobby didn't want, I, the way I got it, he didn't want people, he, by him dating her, he didn't want the people seeing her with me on the TV uh, being, you know, get as we were getting married. But Bobby, it's not real. This is a storyline. And that's how they screwed that up. What happened with Crystal is by, when we was doing that storyline, she would come over to Raw and wait on Bobby, and then people would start seeing her and Bobby lead together, which screws the storyline up now. You know what I mean? They did it's K Fade. They didn't protect it. So that's that's how I don't think he was just mad at me or jealous of me. I think he just didn't didn't want didn't didn't want to see that. Because Bobby was just breaking in too. He was kind of green to the business. So he didn't understand either. You know what I mean? I mean, he might have took it like it was real. So I don't know, but he never said nothing to me, but I did hear that. Did you like you like you got it from somewhere? I got it from you. I think it must have been an old interview with you. So, but um, <laughs> I, having said that, uh, were you sort of like thinking? I don't know how old you were at the time. Maybe I mean you, you must have been in your fifties at that time, and you must have looked at Bobby Lashley and thought, "No way, is this dude jealous of me? Still, I've still got it." I didn't even think about it. Oh, did he not? No. Oh, I didn't even think about that, man. That didn't even cross my mind. Cause I mean, I know it's a storyline. I know it ain't real, so that's why I don't. I ain't even worry about it. Do you know, something I wanted to bring up beforehand when we were talking about The Undertaker, and I forgot, but someone told me uh, quite a while ago that Undertaker had a ritual with new talent coming in that you'd have to do a shot of Jack Daniels with him. Is that uh, Was that the case when you came in? No. All right, no, I was, never, I did a, <laughs> ne- never did it. Never did a shot of Jack Daniels with him. No. Never. I, I've seen people do that, and I don't think it was new talent that came in. I think sometimes, I mean, we were overseas sometimes, and Taker would be in the bar and then guys would go and then they'd do shots with him like that. But I, I never saw him, you know, with the new talent, with shots of the key. I, I never saw that. I will uh, move on then. And dare I say, I'm going to be really squinting now because the font is smaller on this script for some stupid reason. Uh, here we go. Jeff QD has asked, I would be interested to hear what Teddy thinks about smoking with Snoop Dogg and why on earth WWE would ever fine him. Um, well, that was a, like a one of a lifetime. And uh, we the, the first time I smoked with Snoop, we was in Orlando, Florida at a pay-per-view. And Snoop was so good at uh, ma- uh, uh, masking the smell till he had his own little trailer there. So we went in there and we smoked and we come out and he had his brother-in-law, or his uncle or somebody, but they were always on the outside and they had this barbecue grill and they would be barbecuing and grilling and that kept the smell down. People couldn't smell the weed. So that's why they started. That's why he was barbecuing. But the first time I did smoke with him, I knew that there was a, at that time they were finding you a thousand dollars if you tested positive for marijuana. So I said to myself, I said, well, you know, how many guys can say that they had the opportunity to smoke with Snoop Dogg? So I said, fuck it. I'll just, <laughs> if they get me, I'll pay the fine. Cause I mean, it was worth that to smoke with Snoop, but I didn't, I, I didn't, they, it, they never bothered me. I never did get tested for that, but I did have a chance to smoke with Snoop. Oh, so you never got fined then for it? I mean, no, never, no, I did. didn't test me. Cause didn't nobody really know, you know, until later on, you know, we did some of the guys, you know, we knew cause. I wasn't the only person in there. I think Yamaga, God rest his soul, he came in and smoked. Um, 
I was I think Randy, Randy Orton stopped in. Okay, so I wasn't the only person in there. Were you smoking on the regular back in the WWE days then? Not on the regular. I had to stop. Once they started finding people, I quit. And I quit for God almost a year. Okay, because I didn't want to screw up, man. Mm-hmm. Vince gave me a great opportunity, and so I I didn't want to screw that up. So I, I quit smoking, period. Well, there was loads of wrestlers at the time who just considered it the weed tax, and they just paid it and just carried on. Was that not something you were interested well, in? Well, they made the kind of money that they could pay to pay the fine and move on. I didn't make that kind of money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> were you ever, oh, in fact, here's a question, though. Why were they drug testing you? Because, I mean, you weren't, is it just because any on-screen talent was getting tested, simple as that? Laurinaitis. Uh-huh. Mark Carana. Uh-huh. That's that's why they were testing me. But uh, were they testing Eric Bischoff? Or whoever I else have was no a GM? I- were they testing I Vicky have- Guerrero? I I have no idea. Mm. That's a bit suspicious, isn't it? it? Yeah. Well, like I said, they were testing everybody, so... I mean, some of those names you just called, I didn't see them get tested, so I don't know. So, you know, if they're testing everybody, I feel like, you know, I just part of the part of the job, I guess. Mm, uh, but were, that was a way to get you, too. They used that to get people, too. Yeah. Uh, were, you, uh, were you fined for any other reasons over the years? Do you remember? No, I just only got fined for failing the drug test. Yeah. And that was just a weed one? Yes, yeah. weed. That's all I ever had. That's all I ever done. That's all you ever need. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but a lot of guys, you know... I remember one time they uh, Alberto De Rio. They kept trying to get him one time, and so I think he had got the word that the drug people were there. So he never did come. So he waited until about uh, I guess it was seven or eight o'clock. That's when he showed up because he, and then he said that they had a wreck or something. That's why he was late. But they they caught on to him. They made the drug people stay there until he got there. And so when he did show up, they got him. Uh, do you know any of the tricks of the trade of like avoiding any of the drug tests? Uh, well, you get the drink, you know. Well, you you have to have some inside help. You know, a lot of times somebody on the inside would always call some of the guys and say, hey, they're here. Mm-hmm. So then if they were there, you know, we, uh, we, we'd always keep a drink in our bag just for the hell of just to be on the safe side. So if somebody smartened us up and let us know that they were there, then we had that drink. So we drank the drink and put plenty of water before we got to TV. So when we got to TV, we was, we was, we was ready. Yeah. Uh, was Is this the time when it was like the full T-shirt or trousers down the whole bit? No, it wasn't that. It just going in and just urinating. That was it. Okay. Then. Uh, you, taking, did you ever pissing. hear the, the Lex Luger one? Was it the Lex Luger one where he had like a fake dick? Like coming out of his jeans or I, something. I heard somebody did have that. I don't know whether it was him or not, but I did hear somebody did have one of them. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lex, if it wasn't you. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll do our final game, and I will thank you so much for your time. Ken Terminator has asked, Teddy, I can't wait until you talk about the Tony Atlas and the 90-year-old lady story again. Nothing is too old for the Alabama black snake. What about the black snake? I don't know what this story is. So Tony Atlas and a 90-year-old okay, lady. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this story. Okay. Me and Tony Atlas was getting ready to go to the gym in Bridgeport, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So right next to this gym, there was a rehabilitation place, you know, like for people that had car accidents or, you know, if you were in a wheelchair or something, you was going to rehab. Mm-hmm. Well, we get out of the car. There's this lady in front of us. This lady, as I know, is about 80 years old. So she's on this walker and she's walking, you know, to the rehab place Well, Tony is looking down at her. OK, at her feet. You know, he has this foot fetish. Mm-hmm. OK, so he's looking down at her. So I'm looking at him. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I said she's 80 fucking years old. <laughs> uh, I don't care. I just wanted to walk on me, Teddy. I said she can't even walk on her own. She's got a walker, <laughs> man. I just want to walk on you. So then after that story, after that happened, this lady went in. So we go on in this gym, Planet Fitness. So there's another girl in there. And Tony was so good with that foot fetish that he could look at her woman and tell her exactly what size her shoe was. And so there was this girl in there and I was standing right there with him. He ended, he, he started met picking out her, flirting with her. And he told her exactly what size her shoe was. He was just that good. Damn. But he... he yeah, I got some stuff on my phone now where this girl is stomping him in his head and beating him and 
dominatrix stuff, but he he was into it. He it, it just it, I, I don't understand it. He had this girl kicking him in his head with these steel toe boots on. How can you survive? So, I, brother, he'd have brain damage, and she was just kicking him in the head, and he he was sitting there taking it. Where's the enjoyment from it? I don't I don't I, get it. I, I don't I don't know what it is either. But he told me something about when he was a little kid or something about his grandmama or something with. He always rub her feet or he'd do something with her feet or something. But it was something he could do his childhood or something. You'd have to talk to Tony because he don't mind telling you about it. He, he'll he he'll, he'll tell you everything about it. Yeah, I had him on not he too loved long me. ago. Oh, what, did he talk about it? I specifically avoided it. I didn't want to have to tell him how weird it is. <laughs> he probably oh, knows. No, bro, he'd have loved it. He'd have loved telling you about that, man. Yeah, I told him, I said, Tony, you realize how much money you could be making, man? You know what I mean? He could, could, could just with off his name, Tony mm. Ellis, the foot fetish. You know, there's those freaks out there that'll love to be a part, to have him. You know, be a part of that deal, man. But he, uh, he, he never tried. I, he, I, he just likes it. it. That's just his thing. Uh, there was also a interview. Someone else brought this up. I can't find it. Uh, where Tony Atlas and apparently you were there as well. Uh, back in the WWE in like 2007 or eight or wherever, where there was an incident with not an incident, but the Bella Twins in a hot tub, and Tony Atlas spoke about that with uh, with Glee, and he also said you were there and witnessed it. Uh, we was in Corpus Christi, Texas, and um, we had went out, you know, after the show, we stopped and, you know, got something to eat and everything, so we was headed back to the hotel. So we on our way back to the hotel, the, hot the hot tub and uh, pool and stuff was like on the outside. So as we're coming, going to our room, we hear people laughing and talking and stuff, so we kind of stopped to see what it is, so we look over in the hot tub and it's the Bella twins. And I don't know whether it was Law and I was in it too. I don't want to say that because I don't know. We couldn't see that good, but I, we saw the Bella twins and it was two guys in the hot tub with them. So I don't know. I, like I said, we, we was trying to get out of the way. We didn't even want them to know that we seen them, but that that's the story about the hot tub. <laughs> I will uh, move on to our final game then. And we'll okay. do about 10 minutes or so. And then our time will be up. Uh, it might be slightly over 10 minutes, but uh, I, I promise I won't bore you too much with it. And it's uh, the same, but opposite as the name association. I'm just simply going to give you a name and you give me a tiny little bit about them. And that's pretty much it. And we'll get as, through as many as we can in the time we have. And the first one is Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard, uh, yeah, look, uh, great guy, man. Had a chance to work with Bruce a long time, and I gave Bruce this name. I used to call him Master Bruce because he was, <laughs> you know, he was running things, you know, so I used to just mess with him, you know. What you need today, Master Bruce? <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, and I always enjoyed working with Bruce, man. When he was producing uh, my stuff, he a lot of stuff I did. Bruce was one of the producers, and I, to work with Bruce was always a thrill, man, because he was real smart, too, and I learned a lot from him. Now, some of these names are going to be fairly random, but bear with me on them. Stan Lane. Uh, I remember him from back in the day, you know, with the Midnight Express and, and Cornette and him. That's basically all. But always, I hadn't hadn't seen him in, Jesus Christ, years and years. But back in the day, he was, one of, you know, what, a nice guy. Never had any problem with him. Our truth Our truth uh, Another guy. I watched him kind of grow a little bit with his career, but... He did okay for himself, and I think what he got involved in the rap game, so I think he wanted to pursue a career in rap and his future in the rap music. So I don't know what he's doing right now. I haven't heard anything from him, but uh, he, he he was always nice. No, I mean, that dude does not age. I think he's 51. He still looks, looks like he's like 27. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you, it got them good genes. Uh, yep. Yeah. Definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely. I want some of that. Uh, next one is Sable. Uh, I didn't communicate with her too much. I knew her when she was married to Mark Mero, and uh, I knew her a little bit then, but uh, I never did talk to her too much. I remember one time we was overseas, and somebody uh, shit in her bag or something <laughs> like that. And uh, she wanted to take, I think she took it back or she wanted to take the shit back to the States to get it, get a DNA on it so they could tell her who shit it was. I I, I, I never heard of that before, but like I said, that I, that was the story about her. But I never did, like I said, talk to her too much. I didn't, didn't know her that way. No, no one asked you for a shit sample then. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll move on. El Gigante. 
Elegante, uh, he was all right. He was cool. I didn't communicate with him much because uh, he didn't stay around that long. But I think I had more fun with him. I'm not, I mean, with uh, the great Carly than I did with Elegante. No, have you got a story about the Carly, great Carly that you can share then? Oh, well, Carly uh, was a great guy. I tell you what, that was a, we was in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and me, him, and Nick Patrick, I'm, I'm not Nick Patrick, or Mike Kilda, we go to the gym one day. Well, we come out of the gym, we get through with the gym, we come out of the gym, so there's this lady in the car, this black lady, but she's in love with Carly. So he, she's followed us from one, followed Carly with whatever town it was we were in that night, she was there, and she drove, and she just she just kept following Carly everywhere he went. So she was trying to bang him, you know, Carly, you know, he was kind of, he kind of liked the black chicks. So <laughs> she ended up following him everywhere to all the towns. We had to get the police to get her, get her off of him, man. She followed him to the gym and everywhere. She was like a stalker. And then we went to this gym and there was this girl in the gym that fell in love with him. She worked there. She ended up leaving the gym, took, got, left her job and went to Carly's room and she come back to the gym after she banged him and she come back to the gym and they had all her shit in a box waiting on her. They fired her right there. <laughs> we walked you... off the job. <laughs> I didn't realize she left it... her job and went to Carly's room. What is it about great Carly that the ladies love? I guess the size. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how naked people get in the... I don't even want to know, but I'm I'm presuming that the size goes all over the place, not just in height. Yeah, well, I don't know, man, but you know, Kali, and, and he was a real super nice guy too, man. Yeah, he 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 used to bring the Viagra from India. Oh, was that better or? Uh, well, it's the same, but you know, it's 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 cheap. It's cheaper. It was free. Yeah. Well, no wonder he was relaxed. <laughs> he was shooting his load every day, apparently. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, he 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 bangs some chicks now. Good for him. Uh, next one is Randy Orton. Oh, Randy, good guy, man. Uh, met him, me and him started hanging out when he first, you know, broke into the business. I had a chance to work with his daddy back in the day. And I remember one time me and his father, we, one night we was somewhere, I forget where it was, but we smoking and we had smoked so much, we was hungry. So we ended up going to the White Castle and I ended up eating about 15 White Castles. I was sick as a dog. And the next day I had to go to Philly and do a signing with Joe Goodhart or something, I believe his name was. He had this signing in Philadelphia. And boy, I sit there at a table and I just threw up all day long. <laughs> I'm telling you, I ate 15 White Castles, <laughs> me and Bob Orton. <laughs> yeah, me and Bob Orton. And so that when I met Randy Orton, uh, me and Randy, you know, start hanging out. And uh, we had great times, you know, we'd take breaks on TV. Randy had a bus, so we go to, that's the one time I got in trouble with Vince. We, when I, I had this dark match that I had to do, so I didn't understand, you know, about Vince, how professional, you know, and he how everything is business, he filmed everything. So I'm thinking the dark match, I really got nothing to do. I'll just go out and make the dog match. So I, me and Randy, we're on the bus, on his bus. So we're smoking, cause I'm thinking I'm done. So we're, we're, we're fucking high as a kite. Next thing I know, it's time for to make the dog match. So I run out to make the dog match, and Randy's in the dog match. So we're in St. Louis in his hometown. So I'm so high, I'm out. He's the viper. He's the legend killer. He's your hometown boy. I'm, so I'm just fucking, act, it's going crazy. So about that time, I come back through the gorilla, and Vince is standing up, and he's waiting on me. He's telling me, come here. And so I walked over there, so I knew I was in trouble. So he says to me, he says, uh, you in business for yourself out there? I said, no. He says, well, God damn it. They know he's a legend killer. This is his hometown. They know he's a viper. Why in the hell you got to keep telling them? And I just caught myself and I said, sir, you're exactly right. I said, I was playing. I said, I, I, I promise you I, that'll never happen again. And he looks at me and he said, yeah, you're better than that. And that and that was the only time I ever had a problem with him. I, he never got on me again because I didn't never fuck up no more. Uh, a steamed into you in with the next name. Sorry, so it's Timmy White. Who? Referee Timmy White. Timmy White. Uh, Timmy White was a good guy. He helped me a lot when I first started in WWE because I went there as a referee. So Timmy was one of the guys that kind of came to me and helped me out a little bit. So Timmy was a great guy to work with. Randy Savage. Uh, Randy Savage. I'll tell you a good story about Randy Savage and Dick Slater. You remember him? Yep. Dirty Dick Slater? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, I wasn't even in the business then. I was hanging around at the TBS studios in Atlanta, Georgia. This is way back in the day, Georgia Championship Wrestling. So Randy and Slater was together. So Randy wasn't even, Randy, wasn't even much of a man then. So he had this white van. So they wanted some smoke. So they I took them over to the West End. Shane, 
you got to come hear this story. I took him <laughs> over to the West End. I'm talking to Shane Douglas, ladies and gentlemen. He's right behind me here, but here's a story. Here. Shane needs to hear Get that. Get him in there. So I, so, so I took Randy and uh, and and Dick Slater over to this guy in the West End to get some weed, okay? So we get over in the West End. So the guy gets in the car, I see the guy, because I knew him. I'd go over there all the time. Back then, you know, you go over there and they sell the nickel bags and dime bags on the street. So I got the guy. The guy gets in the car and everything. And so he, here's where the guy makes a mistake. He get in the car. Let's see. Randy uh, Savage is in the front. Slater's in the back behind the drivers, behind the guy. So the guy pulls out this big bag of cocaine. He says, hey, guys, I, not only do I got weed, I got cocaine too, big bag. So now I don't know this, but I look up and I see Savage look at look at Slater and he nods his head, which back then I didn't know, but they called it, he gave him the office. So about this time, next thing I know, I look up, Slater has hooked this guy. Right in the sleeper. <laughs> I mean, puts the shoot sleeper on him. They put this fucking guy to sleep, brother, in his car. They took all of his cocaine. They took all of his weed. I was right there with all of them. I could never go back over there, but that's a true story. They <laughs> put him to sleep, left him in the car, and we took all his shit. <laughs> Where to God? It's a true story. What's Shane saying about oh, that? Oh, yeah. Shane said he believes it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a couple more names. I'll give you a couple more names. Greg Garnier. Uh, Greg, I, I I met him over, you know, time and stuff. Always a nice guy. I don't know really that much about him. Didn't get a chance to work with him much, but Greg was always a, you know, nice guy. Lex Luger. Lex Luger, a uh, great guy, man. He's come around a lot. I really enjoy being with Lex now. You know, back in the day, you know, everybody had their faults. You know, he's you know, doing that prima donna stuff, but, you know, sometimes that stuff come back to haunt you. So I think with Lex now, you know, he's come around. He's put God in his life, and so I'm just happy that he's still alive and doing well. Ryback. Ryback, uh, I worked with him a little bit, didn't hang out with him too much, but he was always a nice guy. Missy Hyatt. Missy Hyatt, never, uh, well, here's a story about her, let's see. I was with Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, uh, her, she was married to Missy at, uh, he was married to Missy at the time. And they didn't live too far from me. I was in Woodstock and Eddie, I mean, uh, Eddie and Missy, they went maybe 15 minutes from my house. So I went around to Eddie's uh, house. You know, Eddie wanted to smoke all the time. So I'd go to his house and bring the smoke. But Missy wouldn't let us smoke in the house. He'd kick us out and made us smoke outdoors. So I'm like, man, this is your house. You can't smoke in your own house. So it is this. <laughs> <laughs> so she was, she was being a bit of a dick too. So <laughs> Nikita Koloff. Um, uh, Nikita Koloff. I worked with him for a while. I never will forget the story. My wife, you know, she before you know, she couldn't you couldn't smarten her up if you open her head up. So one time we was in the we was in uh Columbus like was going to Columbus, Georgia. So she was riding with me at that time. So we was driving. So Nikita starts talking in his natural voice. He's not speaking the Russian. So she she's in the front seat with me and she's looking at me and she's looking at him and she's just hunching me like He's not Russian. He's not Russian. I'm like, Will you please? <laughs> oh yeah, she couldn't believe it because he wasn't speaking Russian. It just it shocked her, man. And that was that was that was a true story right there. She couldn't believe it, man. He ain't really Russian. You why didn't you tell? I'm like, will you please calm down? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give. That was you my wife. Couldn't smarten her up and save her life. I'm gonna give you two names and then I will shut this down. Mister Kennedy, Ken Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I had a chance to see him uh, like three months ago. I uh, worked an indie show with him, man. Nice guy. He was one of the guys that was, uh, when I had Rodney Mack, we were doing the White Boy Challenge. Well, Mr. Kennedy was one of the guys that were part of the White Boy Challenge. Mm -hmm. So I never will forget, he come out on TV and I cut this promo on him and he had the blonde hair. And I said to him, I said, see, you want to be white so bad, you done dyed your hair white. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and and. This what written need written that stuff got to come off the top of your head. But Vince kind of trusted me with stuff. You know, I wasn't gonna say nothing screwed up. You know, that would mess up nothing. So I kind of got away with that, and he, he he liked it. So that that helped me out too a little bit. I've uh, I've lied there. I'm still gonna give you two names. Uh, second to last, I promise you this. Terry Funk. Terry Funk, great guy, man. Helped me out a little lot when I was breaking into the business. There's several guys that I call on Christmas and wish them a Merry Christmas, and it was Terry Funk. 
Ricky Steamboat and Harley Race. They really, you know, took care of me back in the day. Mm. So Terry was a great guy to work with. I never forget then Kevin Sullivan, if you ever talk to him, he'll tell you this story. I went one time with Terry. To, I went to Amarillo and uh, we wanted to go by Terry's house. So, but anyway, before we got there, it's me and Kevin and we passed the Polydor Canyon in Amarillo, Texas. Well, I'm I'm full of Valium. I'm so high till I look up at the Polydor Canyon. And I tell Kevin them to stop. Let's look. Let's take a look at that. So it's me, Kevin, and his son uh, Ben. So we we start climbing the Polydor Canyon. Okay. So as we start coming back down, Ben, I uh, guess he loses his watch. That's Kevin's son, and he left his watch up on one of the rocks. So now Ben said, "Leave it alone. Don't worry about it. No, you know me. I'm no, no, Ben. I'll get your watch. I'll find it. I'll go back up there." So I go back climbing up the rocks looking for Ben's watch. And so when I get up to the one rock and I see the watch, but it's on another rock. Well, the Valiums tell me, said, all you got to do is just take a jump right there and you'll be right over on that other rock. Well, that wasn't true. I took that leap and that was it. I start coming down. I hit coming down the Polydor Canyon and I've got both my arms like this and all the skin is off both oh. of my arms when I get down to the bottom. That's how, cause I couldn't stop myself. I'm I'm going down, but I fell down the Polydor Canyon. Oh God, I heard Shane laughing in the background. As well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very last one, Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman, uh, had a chance to work with Paul back in the day uh, when he was managing uh, the Samoans and a lot of other guys. So me and Paul always got along. I never had no problem with Paul. There you go. That was a quick one to end it on. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you for this two hours. Uh, before I let you go, Teddy, uh, give us some plugs for what you're doing. you got podcasts out and all that. Well, i got a couple of podcasts I do. One of them is uh, Sports Kita. Uh, Sports Kita is called The Time Machine. I do that along with Mac Davis and uh, legendary Bill After. And uh, also I do my own podcast along with Mac Davis. It's called Road Trip After Hours. It's on YouTube and a lot of other places. So just Sports Kita, Time Machine, and Road Trip After Hours with Mac Davis and Teddy Long. Yeah, why are you not on Cameo? You should be if you're not. Well, I don't know. I just hadn't even thought about that. Oh, there's a money <laughs> as a money making machine there. Seriously, do some investing in Cameo. You, you, I, I suspect you would do really well. Okay, well, I'll get somebody to help me get on that because you know I'm not too computer whiz. I don't know too much about it. No, don't worry. But I did have I did have the app one time. I just never did follow yeah. up on it. Yeah, well, I'm I'm used to working with fucking Shane. I mean, it, it, I was, <laughs> he's just, he's as big a technophobe as they gets. So <laughs> does Shane know you're saying all this I'll, stuff I'll, about he him? He knows he is. I will tell him as well. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for joining me, Teddy. Absolute pleasure right. again. Thank you for joining. We'll catch you again next time and say goodbye to the uh, people, Ted. All right. Thank you so much for having me, man.